now we're recording because I'm a mature adult. I make farting noises <sighs> with Roger Williams, author of The Metamorphosis of Prime Intellect, my favorite book. If you're a good person, go buy the book. It'll be sticky in the top comment. It'll be in the description. If you don't buy the book, this is a threat. I will burn down your fucking house. Merry Christmas. But yeah, so <laughs> it's. Um, don't do that. Your 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 listeners are not the secretaries of state of Wisconsin or anything like that. Or... We'll fucking <laughs> come for them next. You know what? Everybody, if Roger doesn't have how many people are there in America? If Roger doesn't have three hundred and forty-three million book sales by midnight tonight, <laughs> fucking napalm's gonna rain from the sky. But uh, on a less in- unstable note. Um, or perhaps more, depending on how you look at it. My friend Josh Newman of Reality Playground Podcast, who's been on here a couple times, he uh, he messaged me and like the other other like earlier this week. I still haven't responded to him, so Josh, if you're listening, I'm sorry. But I was like, "Have you seen this?" And it was some alien thing, and I was just like, you know, if it's not like now with like the tic tac off the uss nimitz like now like my threshold for ufo settings is very like it's much higher now you know it's like now 1080p is like regular on tv and now it's like i only watch a movie right so i didn't look at it remember crts yeah right yeah yeah well so i didn't look at it i was just like okay whatever um and then my buddy paul whitcomb who's been on this podcast a lot happy bladed birthday paul he sent something to me and i was like all right the guy I've had on a couple times now, uh, Larry Holcomb, who wrote Presidents and UFOs. Larry texted me to me last night, and I was like, "Larry actually goes and goes to like the presidential libraries and like finds documents for his book." Mm-hmm. So I was like, "Okay." And then Lex Friedman posted today on Instagram, and he was <laughs> like, two things: one, uh, Apparently, there's a Galactic Federation that's in contact with Israel and the United States. Two, apparently, at real Donald Trump is read into this program. Please let us know. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, okay, Lex Friedman's a pretty no bullshit guy. <laughs> and so, after all of that, I texted you, and we were going to do an episode. Uh, you're going to do a reading, but I was like, Roger, we apparently this is a thing now. And you and I have covered every other facet of 2020. And of course. And where the fuck did it come from? And here we are (laughs) at December. It's kind of like the Dark Knight, the Joker. He's like, I knew you'd come for me. And (laughs) And he's like, and you didn't disappoint. That's how I view 2020. How was 2020 going to end? Former head of Israeli space program says Galactic Federation exists and has been in contact with Israel and the United States. It's like you didn't disappoint 2020. <laughs> you didn't. At least, at least it wasn't a giant asteroid. <laughs> right, right. Well, that that would be too simple. That would be too. Yes. Simple. <laughs> because if that came and hit us and killed us all, if that came and that'd hit be us, too obvious. It would be too obvious, but there'd also be no one to like talk about how bad it was because we'd all be dead. 2020 isn't there to kill you. 2020 is there to to wound you and let you know. Yes. 2020 shoots you in the leg and is like ho- hobble away, motherfucker. No, no, 2020 shoots you in the gut and then laughs at you while you're squirming on the ground dying. Not only that, and then and then provides <laughs> provides first aid. So you get back, yes. and he's like, all right, I'll see you next week. <laughs> That's who 2020 is. It's like a comment I saw about the uh, the people who uh, harvest the, the giant, the Alaskan king crabs, and they saw mm-hmm. like, a lot of times they'll like rip off that big claw that they have and yeah. throw them back. What the fuck? And so... I'm listening. And so they're like, you know, they come back next year and they do this. And it's like, you, you look from the crab's point of view. What the fuck? You again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I saw this thing that of like, um, it was like sashimi or something. And it was like this, this chef cutting this octopus. And he like, oh, man. He like took it. He like cut it. And he like removes like the cartilage of the skull. And the thing's trying to like move away and he like pulls it back in and then removes another part. And I'm like, to us, this is just like, oh, this is a really high class sashimi place. No, it's it's actually it's actually live. But to them, this is the inner circle of hell. This is like these <laughs> massive creatures, a hundred times my size, hold me down and slice me apart. And as I run away, they pull me back in. 
and then they put salt on my exposed brain, and then they sell me at a competitive price. <laughs> right? And you can go on Yelp and leave a review. Oh, I ate that thing's brain. It was all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Just fucking. That was your brain being eaten. Yeah, three on a scale of five. Yeah, just like, okay. Why do we think we deserve any better? <laughs> Aliens show up. Why do we think we deserve any better? So. So. Either it's bullshit. Yeah. Or it's not. Yeah. And considering how things have unfolded, it's pretty terrifying either way. Yeah. Um, to start with the boring, simple possibility that it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Where What's the, the end goal? fuck did this come from? It's like, why are... Why, you know, Former head of Israeli space program. Right, but okay. Yeah, no. Okay, so so far we're getting this from one guy that we assume... But... Is not couple, like off his meds or something. Well, don't forget a couple years ago, Honorable Paul Hillier, Rob Hillier, Paul Hillier, former head of the Canadian Defense Department, came out and said, and he even did an AMA on Reddit a couple of years ago, and everyone was making fun of him. But he was very matter of, he's all there, he's got his faculties. He was like, well, he's like, well, there is a federation of advanced uh, civilizations in the galaxy, and humanity is not, we're kind of quarantined to this planet because we have not evolved past, like, like murder and destruction and exploitation. Like, that's the limiting, like, you're not allowed to leave your solar system if you still do that. <laughs> But he said it just very, very matter of factly. And people were like, what are you smoking? And he was like, no, there's like, there's like, it's this whole federation. And he's like, um, they respect free will. Like they're not going to force themselves on you. But uh, like, you can't come into the galaxy if you're like, you know, guns blazing. And everyone kind of made fun of him. But now that's like, well, now that's two. And then don't forget Lord Hill Norton, a former five-star admiral from the UK. And I had on Nick Pope of the Ministry of Defense who knew Lord Hill Norton. Talks about how Lord Hill Norton was like, I believe we're being visited by like a whole array of extraterrestrials. So is it just one or is it? Well, that brings us to (laughs) the other possibility that it's not bullshit. And... Yeah, the, the, but the thing is, it's like I haven't just read this story; I've written it. Yeah. You know, the, yeah, the aliens show up, and they're fucking bewildered because there's not like a governing planetary authority that they can speak to or anything. They're just like, "What is up with these dicks?" They're, they're just like, they're, "It's like who's running the goddamn show?" <laughs> It looks like rolling into Afghanistan. It's like you yeah. have the central government, but really you have a bunch of warlords. It's like a fucking fractal. It's like at every level, there's no fucking governing authority. It's like you get down to the the level of ants in a sugar cube, and it's like no one's running the show. Uh, but you know, so so, but assuming that this is a thing, okay, then you know, like the Israelis. Right. Okay. So the aliens come from wherever, out in the galaxy. Presumably, they don't bring a political map of the Earth with them. And so they're sitting out beyond the orbit of the moon or wherever, looking at this place going, hmm. What do you, you know, it's like, how, how, how do we approach this? Yeah. It's like, how do the fucking Israelis get involved? Because this is like, Okay, so you've got like 160 different bodies that think that they're governing one quarter of this, you know, the, this, this or that postage stamp. And it's like now, and they've got really like, if you start to figure it out, like if you're an alien and you have no fucking clue about the history of mankind. Well, you can you can kind of figure out the places that glow in the dark at night might be important. Yeah. yeah. And you might figure out that there are some places that have more of those than others. And you, you pick a few people up and give them probes and whatever you do and figure out, okay, this, so you start to figure out the situation. 
And you're going to figure out at some point that there's four or five really big regions of the Earth that have the big dick energy. That oh, like, yeah, the power. Okay. Yeah. And Israel is not one of them. No. <laughs> but what they said is it wasn't Israel. It was they. They know the United States, and and the reason why I think he even included Israel is because it was the Israeli head. But he what he said is United States and Israel. So if anything, it's the United States, and then yeah, here's our little brother Israel. But you know, it, but the other thing they said is the way that they phrased it is that and is that Donald Trump knows about it. <sighs> To me, that almost gives it more credence because, of course, 2020, it's not like, <laughs> right? It's not like in... <laughs> I'm going like, it's like, it, not the government knows about it or Mulder and Scully know about yeah. it or, or, yeah. you know, or there is a confederation of government. You know, really, what this does is it, 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 the, the only way that this is remotely believable is mm -hmm. in a kind of Stargate SG-1 situation. Sure. Where, you know... They went for 10 fucking seasons with all of this extraterrestrial crap going on, and the general public of the Earth knew nothing about it. Sure. And I remember thinking it was the, – the thing is, is I, didn't, I didn't experience SG-1 the way most people did because I don't pay for television. So I didn't see any of the series until Hulu jammed the whole thing, mm -hmm. and they released – one uh, year each month. Mm -hmm. So you know, so it was a season a month for ten months, Hell and yeah. that, and that was like for the you know there was a bunch of us in the comments on YouTube or, or on Hulu rather. It was like that that's that first Saturday that month that was blown. That <laughs> that whole weekend was done because yeah. there's like twenty one episodes. But that was a great way to see it because you 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 resolved all of the arcs and shit and saw all the complicated stuff happening. But I still remember being, you know, around the middle of the season two going, there's no fucking way they're keeping this secret from everybody yeah. this long. Yeah. I mean, it's just not I mean, seriously? Yeah. I mean, you know, it rolled with it for the dramatic potential and all, but really? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's like so. This Galactic Federation is it's like uh, yeah. Um, so they're like what they came here in UFOs. It, it, it doesn't specify any of that. No, it, it, you know it's. Uh, I think it's kind of implied though. But, but yeah, it, maybe it, maybe there's actually a Stargate buried in the bottom of Cheyenne Mountain. <laughs> I fucking hope. I couldn't. I would. <laughs> If that was true, I would just die on the spot because my soul would just say, "We've we've been actualized. This is my this is my eight. This is the climax of my being. I would just dissolve into Buddhahood. There's nothing else to do. Yes, There's nothing else to do. And I would just I would, I would be a pile of sand. Except except get conquered by the Gwald. Yeah, right. But <laughs> the way I look at it, and isn't it great that I'm wearing my my hoodie, my Alex Jones hoodie I made. Mm -hmm. and it's, I saw that. It's yes. got a whole rant of just him screaming about aliens and it arrived today. And today is the day we're doing this episode. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's actually very cozy. But yeah, they, you're right. Why, you know, why choose Israel? I don't look at it as that. I look at it as they chose America. And because it's an Israeli guy disclosing it, he's kind of thrown in Israel, right? It'd be like if I met Michael Jordan and then someone said Michael Jordan received the best basketball player ever award. I'd be like, yeah, me and MJ got this award. It'd be like, <laughs> you were just like, you were in the limo with them. You didn't get it. Like, so yeah. kind of how I view it, one. And two, um, let's just, I mean, the whole idea is retarded. So let's, just, so let's just. I, I think I think in like our first podcast, you used the phrase "room temperature IQ." Room temperature <laughs> IQ, mouth breathing retard. Yeah, right, right. And but but it's like this is it's like it's on fucking CNN. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'm saying though. Like, you mean no? It, I mean it's like you definitely ride the short bus, right? You can you can sit in the back <laughs> row and put your feet on the dashboard. Like it's a short <laughs> bus, right? So <laughs> so. I just made that up. I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> but uh, it works. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> but so let's let's just but let's toy with this, right? Let's 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 kind of take into consideration the whole thing's insane. That being said, so let's entertain it. 
okay, well, we do have an internet, right? So maybe it wouldn't necessarily be a blind, do they have a political map? Like maybe you could tap into the internet and assuming they have super advanced computers, they could probably tap in and in like in a millisecond, almost have like a, like a, like a, an index card come out and be like, this is the general gist of humanity kind of thing, right? It's like the, yeah, like the, the reverse it. of Independence Day, where the original was that we got our computer uh, Virus, technology yeah. from them. Oh, yeah. And that's why Jeff Goldblum was able to hack their mothership in the first Independence Day, was because we actually learned how to build computers from the aliens. David, but, David why is my mother going to Atlanta? <laughs> but... Because they're telepathic, they don't have any concept of security protocols or anything. So when we get in there, it's like we just hack their shit because they their shit can't be you know they they can't hack each other's shit because they're telepathic, and so it doesn't even occur to them that someone might come into your computer system and do something malicious. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not no peace. but be no yeah. peace. the. The funny thing is the uh, that Earth is actually putting out a little less radio energy pollution than we used to because we aren't using optics, right hmm? fiber optics, right? Right. Yeah, and uh, you know we're we're not depending as much on these powerful radio transmitters to send things around the world. So there's a I've seen the conjecture that within another century or so. Uh, the Earth won't be the loudest radio star in the galaxy anymore wow. because we won't have any reason to put so much energy into broadcasting radio waves because we'll be doing it all by fiber optics and undersea cables and stuff. And uh, we'll only actually use radio for the shit that you need radio for. Which, uh, incidentally, as I am, uh, you probably saw the radio dish that we used to send the intergalactic uh, memorandum. Arecibo collapsed. Maybe that's why they're showing up. <laughs> it's like, like maybe that's why the Federation's showing up. Phone went dead. They're like, yes. "Yo, we're just checking. We're just doing a courtesy call." <laughs> Phone went dead. Everything good? We know you guys were sick. We know you had a pandemic thing going on. We looked at your atmosphere. It's been getting warmer. You're running a fever. Yeah. It goes down. Everything good? You got a, you know, had how many hurricanes this year? It's like these, you know, your atmosphere is being a little disturbed too. A little so. wonky. Yeah. Everything's going weird. Yeah. Actually, the atmosphere being disturbed is one of the things that contributed to Arecibo collapsing. <laughs> what What did What did lead to it to collapse? I well, just, it was fifty it, years old. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of of. Yeah, of, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what it okay, is. Okay, so you know it had these three ginormous towers. Yeah. With cables suspending the thing in the middle. Yeah. Uh, above the the uh, the focal point of the dish, and one of the cables snapped about six months ago. And it drug a giant gash in the main dish. And of course, the dish is stationary. The dish was just basically built over a pothole, yeah. you know, over a sinkhole in the Puerto Rican landscape. Um, so they were trying to figure out what to do about that. But the problem was because that cable snapped, it put more strain on the other cables. Um, and these things are carrying like 1.6 million pounds of force each. Uh, so you know, because the thing in the in the middle was was it's enormous. It was enormous. Was, was pretty ginormous. Yeah, and uh, got just like a few weeks ago, I saw a YouTube video that was made before it collapsed by uh, a couple of guys that went on a big tour. They actually walked the catwalk up to the the the, the thing in the middle and uh, down to the where the receivers were and all. And it was just like, it was fucking incredible. Yeah. But, you know, so this cable snapped months ago. And when it snapped, it dug a big trench in the dish itself. And uh, then the NSF was trying to figure out what the hell we're going to do about this. And they were kind of still in that mode. You know, it's like no one can go into it, you know, you know because it's, it's unstable now. And so it wasn't safe for anybody to go like up to the antenna receiver uh, horn or anything. 
and they were still kind of mullet in it. And, 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 and I'm sure this had nothing to do with the fact that a certain president of the United States obviously hates Puerto Rico. I'm, I'm just saying, okay. <laughs> just a statement. Yeah, it's like. Just an aside. Too, too many Puerto Ricans in his rental properties. Too can, many, too yeah, many. They okay. can't have, I don't want them using that dish to listen so, to them. So we can't, we can't, we can't be spending money on their, their stupid little island. Okay. Well, their stupid little island, the rest of the cable snapped. Yeah. And there is now video online of the whole thing. In fact, it turns That's out. There the video, yeah. Roger. Roger. Hmm? You, fro you froze up. It said turns out and then it froze it up. Oh. You're good. You're good now. Uh, yep. Yeah. Now I got a little, your internet connection is unstable thing. The internet has been wonky for the last week or so. Yeah. Uh, there was a drone, mm -hmm. aerial four, four, four quad, quadcopter drone. Okay. Yeah. I watched it. Monitoring the cable at the time when it snapped, no, when it, when it, it pulled, when it yeah. out from its mooring point. Yeah. It was like, that doesn't happen every day. Yeah. No, that was <laughs> awesome. That's a, it was awesome that it was covered. If you look at some of the videos of the things, the it just looks, it, the things holding they just look something like they look like something that doesn't move just like a big you know like a well they're not stick. supposed to yeah and then you see it just like <laughs> boom, and you're like that's a lot of force involved yeah uh scott manley who uh is a big youtube uh uh -huh. channel guy uh yeah. had a uh, uh an episode where he re he went through it frame by frame yeah as the you know the video is as the uh the drone footage unraveled and the, you know, show it's like, and here is, you know, like the one cable that had not started unraveling it was pristine. And then, you know, looking at it uh, at a quarter speed, you could see the one started, you know, the one ripped loose. And then this last one that was pristine now is holding all of the tension. And then you can just see it start to unravel and throw the paint off and, and the, yeah, the coating as, as, as it's starting to come apart yeah. and then it's just like it's like oh fuck it it's oh fuck <laughs> right that's what that cable is saying it was just like fuck fuck yeah. it Can't. fuck it i'm out Face. <laughs> stage left <laughs> yeah left. i'm out free fall yeah it's so so we need to build a bigger one the Chinese already did. Yeah, I know they have that big that yeah. There's, but but that's kind of old. It's not new. Oh no, the Chinese built just just built one in the last couple of years. It's bigger than Arecibo, but it doesn't transmit. Yeah, that's the that's the the Chinese caveat is it's built the thing. Like, the thing is, like, yeah, so it doesn't work. Well, it can't do all this radar shit that Arecibo did. You know, it's like all these pictures of asteroids that are about that big and all that, you know, they, they've been able, that was all radio. That was all, a lot of that was Arecibo. Mm -hmm. It's like you send out a billion watt pulse yeah. and get the returns back and through really fancy math, they can reconstruct these pictures of mm -hmm. little teeny things. You know, you can't get that with optics, uh, uh, optical telescopes that, it's because you can't do the really fancy math and you know because because you're not getting this uh it's weird because radio radio frequency even even millimeter radio signals are such a much longer wavelength than light then you're used to thinking that well your resolution is going to be lower that's the way that it works with tel telescopes and shit but what it really happens is that with radio telescopes, you get the data in such detail that uh, that you can reconstruct bigger pictures. Yeah, it's 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 nuts, actually, kind of. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, it's like we were getting better, especially with like near Earth asteroids with Arecibo than we ever could with any of the optical telescopes, including Hubble. So. Yeah, it's like now that uh, now the Chinese have a a, a telescope, a, a radio telescope that's like half again as big as Arecibo was. But my understanding is that it doesn't have transmit capability, so you can't do radar with it. Yeah, which is like, why the fuck bother? Yeah, yeah, it, it's it just takes in right. But the China, the China now the Chinese, what they've been up to 
lately is is kind of weird because you know it's like so they've launched you know like four moon landers now mm -hmm. they did a sample return mission yep. yeah it just took off the other day yeah uh, it's like and you're you know, like why are they doing this this is like it's not like they're gonna be first or anything but it's like it's almost more like well now that the Russians and the Americans have left the playing field. We can be the big champions. <laughs> and, hey, it's a, just as it was in the 60s. It's a propaganda coup. Yeah. Uh, well, it, except that they're not using it that way, though. It's more like it's the, the, the impression I get is more like there's somebody that they're trying to impress that's like high in, in their government who sure. might be one. You know, and, and, and I, I, was given the same impression about like the uh the big dam the three gorges dam sure you know it was like that there was this urge to be superlative that, probably probably winning funding right look at look what i did look at i did with the money you know <laughs> but really i mean if, i mean really though they could because they control all aspects of the economy and they can remove money from private corporations every corporation in china has to have at least one ccp board member and they can withdraw money from one place mm -hmm. and put it to another place and that's their sort of tactical that's how they can push things that aren't profitable like the belt and road initiative it might be that it might be someone trying to play that system from within just for their own gains they want a higher up spot well the impression that I was given was that there was someone very high up that everyone's trying to impress. Okay. With how we are moving. Because for many, many years, China was like not bothering. They were, they were, they were like the people going, Hmm, you two on the play and field. Okay. You guys beat one another up. We're just going to stand here like the animal nerd yeah. that gets laid while the other two are buttoning each other's heads. We're just going to, yeah. <laughs> Fighting conquer, and uh, but now it's like they're you know they're spending a bunch of money to go for things. The you know they're they're looking at doing their own space station. Uh, they're 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 actually talking about a manned moon landing in the near future, and honestly, it looks like they might pull it off. The yes. the rate they've been going. Do you think it could have something to do with trying to attract kind of like how America attracts like all the world's like engineers and stuff because they want to go work here? Do you think it might just be a long con start to build this up? So in 2040, 2050, they can be like, come to China. Look what we do. I don't think they think that way, though. I think I think that they think that they've got the world's best engineers. Hold I on. mean, hold on. I forgot. New camera. Oh, cool. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, I meant to set it up. Oh, but I, this is what I don't like is it's it's high up, so I'm looking at you, but it doesn't look like I'm looking at you, right? Yeah. I, well, I had the same problem when I was, like, reading off the other monitor here. Yeah. And, and then I'm like that, and, and it, I didn't like the way that came out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I wish it could be. It's yeah, what you want is to be like right above the screen of your computer. Yeah. Because hmm. because you're gonna look at the image on the screen. You're gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna be looking at your sexy face and uh, <laughs> put some books under this thing. It's but I'm still not looking at. You. I need to. I need to figure that out. Yeah, you're still looking down a bit. Yeah, I need to figure that out. But I did get a tripod for it instead of trying to balance it. <laughs> I mean, the image looks great, though, right? Oh yes. Well, I mean, they. Well, I mean, at my end of the internet connection, I'm looking at a. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Anyway. Even oh wait, you wait, Roger. You can change the. Go up to the top right hand corner and. Zoom. Yeah. No, you told me about that. I'm, okay, I'm, okay. I'm, yeah. The. Uh, well, hey, there's Nora. What they're called, but. Uh, there's the uh, bunker. Yeah, it's more that I'm not looking at myself as a little pixelated thumbnail when I'm trying to demonstrate shit to you, gotcha. which was a thing. I don't know why I'm just showing you the whole whole setup. Xbox. <laughs> oh, you can finally look around. Yeah, you can see. Hey, there we go. Yeah. 4K. Your big monitor. Six hard drives. <laughs> That's 76 terabytes. I saw a retrospective of Johnny Mnemonic the other day. 
um, you remember the movie from the 90s? And, uh, you know, the guy is uh, a, uh, an information courier, and he has his brain hacked mm -hmm. so that he can carry information around. And it was like he, uh, he was completely overloaded because his capacity was 160 gigabytes, but the, uh, they had uh, given him 300 and uh, some odd gigabytes. And, and this was like, when they made this movie in the mid nineties, of course, this was like a fantastically large amount of information. So yeah, yeah you would have to ha like hack your brain and use your neurons or something. And now it's like, we're saying, it's like, this isn't even yeah, you know, that's, that that's much, you know, the SSD in my computer. Yeah. It's like, how much is it? You're like, fuck, you could probably upgrade it. Because that, what I just showed you, yeah, that's 76 terabytes. I have. Put it on a fucking SD card. It's about yeah. that big. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they still, it's still kind of working for uh, Terminator 2, I think. When they're putting Skynet on, and he's like, Skynet up and running. And at the very end, it's the Air Force guy. And he's looking at it, and he goes, all right, we're, you know, 70, terab like 70 terabytes per second. Like, so it's still pretty good. That yeah. still, still holds up. That that number still holds up. <laughs> but not for long. Not for long. It's, not, the, not the right we're going. <laughs> it, it, it was a, when it first came out, and I remember first seeing it, it that was like a good sci fi number. But now it's like, now it's impressive. It's impressive, but like, it's not that far out of reach. No. It is, and but that, it isn't. That, that, that's one of those things where being a science fiction writer bites you on the ass. Yeah. The, uh, uh, of course, my fa my favorite science fiction bites you on the ass thing is the first line of the novel Neuromancer, which was the sky was the color of a television set turned to an unused channel, which when William Gibson wrote that in 1981 would have been gray. It hasn't been gray for 30 years. Yeah, it's been blue. Yeah, I was about to say blue. Yeah. And that completely inverts the whole thing because he wanted it to be like this gray dim yeah. thing. And, and, and reality came and bit his pros on the ass. Yeah. But I wonder if like, because right, because at first the story, it always fucks over the stories. It's like there was a whopping two gigabytes, right? And it's like, <laughs> but I wonder if there's this sort of like, if there's like an oscillation, like within 20 years, it starts to make it look goofy. But maybe it sort of swings back around to where a long enough time goes by and you almost get that like Jules Verne effect, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or something, where it's like, now it's like, yeah, the entire thing is old, but it's like, now it's just cool because the idea itself. Well, there, there yeah, be, it, because you, you go through the period where it's contemporary, but mm -hmm. it's stupid. Mm -hmm. And then you, you finally go to where you can appreciate it as the, from, in its historical context. Yeah. So... You know, like when we're reading a Jules Verne novel, okay, we understand that, okay, they didn't have computers and they didn't have nuclear reactors and they didn't have all this other stuff in his day. So we can appreciate where he's writing from. And we're getting there now with, to, I, I think, with some of the science fiction from the 40s and 50s. Um, the, uh, I think it's just a matter of time before we see uh, a Heinlein novel that is not the incredible uh, whack job that Starship Troopers was. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, <laughs> I, it's like, I, bet. I mean, it's like, well, and, and the thing is, the thing about Starship Troopers was that Paul Verhoeven grew up around actual Nazis. You know, he lived in, in, in an occupied power <laughs> and remembered actual Nazis. And so when he made Starship Troopers, his tongue was not in his cheek at all. He mm -hmm. knew exactly it, what he was doing. Yeah. And it wasn't supposed to, you know, it was, it was the kind of thing, actually it was supposed to be funny until you realize it's not. Yeah, right. It's kind of like J.R.R. Tolkien writing about describing the battles of Middle Earth. because He's describing them because he, he just came back from fighting in the trenches of World War One, and that's right. what he's writing as is like these muddy hellscapes of just a yeah. hundred thousand ants moving along. Like that's yeah. Really, yeah. So 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 these stories eventually reach a point where you can look at them at a remove. Yeah, and you 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 can appreciate. Oh yeah, well well Heinlein was reacting to this historical force when he wrote that. And uh, the, yeah, the, 
then you, you're like, well, he was reacting to that historical force for this reason from when he was writing that. And so it's, it's like almost these layers build up. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. The, where do we even get into this from? Who cares, I mean, man? Uh, Roger, right now you and I are, we are beta testing our free ranting episode. We are seeing how... Yes. Well, yeah, it's like my plan, you know, uh, my, my microphone decided that not to work after all of this. Because uh, what I was going to do was uh, talk about, well, uh, I mean, and we, and we can still talk about that. You know, even if I don't read you the story, I can tell you how I got into that thing was uh, I, I, haven't ta- I, I haven't called Noah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the reason is that I talked to my wife instead. Mm-hmm. And she uh, also writes. And she has done some uh, targeted genre fiction mm-hmm. on Amazon, and including some where there have been collaborators. And they've had a couple of things that they hired a narrator for mm-hmm. to, to get them on Audible. And I was talking to her at random about it when I was thinking of call, you know, writing Noah. And, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, first of all, skilled labor mm-hmm. that where, where, where you're, you're not just paying someone's salary, but where you're paying all of their overhead and their costs and everything generally runs a hundred to $200 an hour. That's, you know, I was, I was given the speech by my boss when many, many, many years ago that uh, as a rule of thumb, that the scale rate for someone to hire my company to use my work would be about four times what I make. Yeah. And that's what it takes to cover the overhead of the building, the vehicle, the tools, the training, the time when I'm not being doing billable things, all and all this other stuff. Yeah. And uh, so, if if you're charging less than a hundred bucks an hour for your time, then you're probably ripping yourself off. Yeah. And uh, Noah obviously knew what he was doing, big time. Yeah. So it's like now. Above above two hundred dollars, the air gets thin. But you know, you start to look at somebody who has a national reputation, who has a big portfolio, who has a you know a lot of experience. Then you're talking about even more than that. Mm-hmm. Now, it takes about six hours to read Mopey aloud. Don't ask me how I know that. Well, actually, you can probably figure out how I know that. But that doesn't count the pre-read where you figure out what are you, what are you going to do about all of the little effects and stuff, like the computer dialogue sections about the different characters. At least Mopey doesn't have a lot of different characters. You know, in some, some of these stories, they, they actually hire voice actors to do the different characters because otherwise you wouldn't keep them straight. That's not a problem for Mopey, at least. But you know, you've got to go through it, make sure you know how to handle all of the, because I'm a very visual writer. I, I, I do a lot of uh, little tricks with the formatting to create an impression on the page as you're, as you're reading it. And getting that to come through on Audible is, is going to require making sure you have some idea what's coming up that you're going to do a scene shift or, or a switch to a different venue or something. Uh, in the story that I was planning to read you, there is a shift between the present case and uh, a series of things in the past that are converging on the present. And so in the original story, there was a horizontal line. Mm-hmm. And you can't read horizontal line. So I was thinking about it and I had to read the story. I actually read the story aloud several times to myself so I could hear how it sounded and realized the best thing to do at those points was to say present day. We're not in the past anymore. Present day, 
here we are back in the current story. So you've got to figure all that stuff out. Then, as Noah was saying, you're going to make mistakes. You've got, you've got to listen to it after you've done it. Make sure that everything is correct. Because I'm, I'm like that myself. It's like the idea of just reading it and spraying all the mistakes out and saying, fuck it, this is the author, is not me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm Perfectionist is not the right word, but I don't like to deliver a crap product. Yeah. If, if, if I leave a mistake in there that is obvious, I'm going to hear that motherfucker every single time I listen to it myself. Yeah. So, you know, so you got to go back, redo the things that need to be redone, apply any of the audio stuff. So you're talking about 20 or 30 hours yeah. of skilled labor to turn the metamorphosis of prime intellect into an audio book. Yeah. Still got like what sixty thousand. Well, I think he added a zero in there, but it, it'd be in the order of you know two to six thousand dollars. Wait, 10, ten hours at two hundred an hour. It's two thousand. And you're doing thirty hours. I'm I'm a moron. <laughs> <laughs> he added a zero. Yeah, you would be looking at between two thousand and six thousand dollars, most likely. And and the thing is. The book brings in between two and three thousand dollars a year. Sure. So six grand to have it turned into an audiobook is not a thing that's gonna happen. Which yeah. means that if it gets turned into an audiobook, it's gonna be because I narrated the fucking thing myself. That's the only way it's gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, thus the studio <laughs> microphone yeah. and the buff shield and uh, you know and uh It's uh, and it's weird because well, one of the things that uh, my wife said was that because of the COVID thing this year, audio books have become more popular, and the the labor of narrators has become more expensive because they're in more demand to make more audio books for the people who are stuck at home and various things because of the COVID mess. So that's another thing. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. But you also got to think, and this is obviously, I don't give a fuck with, you know, you do what you do. You, I don't get I'm not seeing anything from any of it. So I don't give a fuck. I've read it. I like it. But I, for me personally, like if you put it on audible, I bet so many more people would, would, would discover it. And yeah. you'd probably be making more than two or three grand a year. Roger, I have to piss really badly. We, I haven't even made it 45 minutes. <laughs> worse than, <laughs> this is worse than normal. Roger, <laughs> take the stage. Okay, so the Metamorphosis of Prime Intellect is available on Amazon and all of the usual booksellers. But if you want a paper copy, please consider buying it directly from lulu.com, L U L U. Com. They are the original publishers who actually print the copies, and they have to charge you the same amount because of the way that the contracts are written, but because they are the original publisher and they don't take Amazon's cut, I get a lot more of the money. So, uh, And uh, as you can hear, we're thinking about doing some of my other works. Um, you can catch up with uh, some of the other stuff that I've written on my private little repository website, local Roger, L O C A L R O G E R dot com. And uh, on that site, you'll see that a lot of my things uh, are on Smashwords and Goodreads and uh, stuff like that. I think it's the Smashwords ones. There's one that you can set your price and uh, you can set your price to zero. That's fine with me. Um, the reason that we did that is that my wife warned me that my site would get delisted from the search rankings if it looked like I was doing duplicate content and they delisted me anyway so one of these days I'm going to go back to just hosting it myself but I haven't yet so anyway bastards 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 I want to ask you about your microphone because I'm thinking about investing in a uh, I've got all the memory I need now I've got 76 terabytes on the desk and i've got 25 in emp shielded norad okay audio technica 
And what is the, the thing in front of it? What? That? No, 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 no. The other thing you showed me. Oh, that's a puff shield. What is a puff shield? It's to stop. Like a bit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, when, that when, uh, that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, because because the, the thing on the microphone isn't really large enough to stop. Like if you. you yeah. Know, blast of air and as as we naturally do when doing certain uh consonants and stuff and the larger puff shield is about stopping that so the way you would normally deploy this is you would have this here and yeah, this that, yeah about like about like so okay. and uh but the thing is this microphone is uh it's a usb microphone and I had it working like two days ago, and when I went to do the mic test right before, uh, you know, literally like the moment after I said, let's roll on the on the text thing, I went, I plugged it in, did the mic test, and there's like no audio. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. the driver is just like being skittish again. Yeah. But I think that's another one of those things that's been improved lately. But, uh, but yeah, uh, you'll notice, um, like uh when uh in the podcast where Lex interviewed uh oh sh I know, he, I know who you're talking about, I can't remember his name, but yeah. yeah. But uh but he was using Yeah on yeah. on both on both ends. Uh yeah. so you'll see that occasionally if you see the videos of other people who are doing podcasts that uh they because this is a standard radio type setup. Yeah. Where, where you have the, the microphone, but then you have one of these Puff shields in uh, in place just to keep the poof 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 yeah. poof sound yeah. sound out of out of it. Yeah. And of course, uh, of course, I've got the worst of all worlds here because I've got this completely unshielded mic because even its little foam thing just disintegrated because it's so old. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can definitely. I if you ever listen on Spotify to this podcast, the little thing I do at the beginning for Anchor, you can tell in the ad it's like "Welcome to Tommy's like podcast." You can hear yes. it. It's like. Bah, 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 bah. It's like and yeah, that's that's what this thing is about. Yeah, you know, so yeah, if you if you if you want to prevent that, but I noticed that you're very mobile as as you 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 move around your office a lot, and and for this to be effective, you really kind of have to situate it between you and the microphone. Yeah. So, uh, so you would have to be more in one place. Now, uh, I had also planned because of having the external microphone, I was going to use my Bluetooth headphones instead of these, so I wouldn't be tethered to the damn desk anymore. And well, all that fell apart at the eleventh hour. Um, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been thinking of how to do that because yeah, I want to get um, I want to get like the top tier one, the Sure SMB, the one that like Rogan uses. All the podcasters use it. It's like it's a really good one. I want to get yeah. the Puff Shield. And I want to get it mounted so I can kind of just because right now, like this is on my I, I place it on my laptop, and right? Because I'm in a weird spot where it's like I don't have a physical guest; I just have speakers of your voice coming through. So I've been thinking maybe I need to get two microphones and put one right above the speaker so it's your voice, and then also have one like mounted over here and just have it like right here next to my voice. I don't know. But I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know like how to split the audio or. Well, you, well, you don't need. Yeah, that's uh, that's more of a software thing because you're getting the audio already in digital form over the internet for me. So you don't need like a microphone for me. Oh, but I found getting the so like Zoom takes the audio directly, like the mm -hmm. digital versus like I record it coming out of the speakers. It is worse quality through Zoom versus. You can hear the difference. The, the videos I upload to BitChute are the Zoom ones, and they use the Zoom audio. The ones I upload to YouTube are the ones that are captured by this microphone already coming through the speaker. That quality is better than the digital. No, maybe that just might be Zoom. Zoom might be, just be giving me a shitty digital version. But that doesn't make sense, though, because... Yeah, because, because you're getting my maybe, audio maybe, through Zoom. Through Zoom. <laughs> like, right now, it's like, I'm right? So it's... Maybe so Zoom's got you're right. Zoom's got to condense it or or compress it or something. Yeah, but, the, but but that's what you're getting at your computer in a digital form. So yeah. they're, they're, the the only way they're making it better is by doing some kind of processing on it to try and restore what's been lost in the transmission process or something. Yeah, and that's it's, what I record with my microphone. Is yeah. So, 
Yeah, that that's strange. That, Isn't it? <laughs> it's, yeah, there's like there's definitely a difference between it when it comes out of the speaker versus the actual digital file that they just deliver. Or you know what? It might be maybe it's not your voice because I know the quality quality is worse, but I don't know. Is it the guest's quality is worse or my quality is worse? I I can't I I cannot really imagine a scenario where the quality of my voice would be better if you put it through a speaker and another microphone versus just digitally recording what what's yeah. receiving over the internet but yours that's a different story i got an idea right now i'm gonna pull up um let's pull up i was about to say i hope i don't get yanked but then i realized this is my youtube this is my i can play my own shit <laughs> so don't be too sure of that that's well, well you know what if this is how I, got, I got delisted from from google for for put, hosting my own stories well you know what if this is how <laughs> i go then fucking this is how we go roger if i go down if i get yanked for playing my own material then it was meant to be okay <laughs> that it was meant to be i'm not even monetized they still haven't monetized me yet so this is let's listen to 267 the science of measuring length this is youtube start recording that quickly that might be a new record but yeah, fucking recording <laughs> but um but yeah now did you get a haircut all right so now let's find that on bit shoot and see if you can't uh probably should have had it already pulled up so it would be quick back to back but <laughs> fuck fuck me i guess everything it, is so complicated everything is so complicated fuck it intergalactic aliens they're here just fucking roll with it i don't fuck it i don't give it's a their shit. fault i don't give a shit I don't, all their care, fault. I don't care if I get yanked because you know what? The Federation's here. Okay. Now it should be pulling up if BitChute wasn't such a piece of shit fucking video player. <laughs> BitChute sucks so much. BitChute sucks so much dick. I'm going to start uploading. I uploaded my first video to Rumble. I don't even know what Rumble was. Apparently it's like another YouTube alternative. Never heard of it. Neither have I, but I'm willing to give them a shot because YouTube is a YouTube is a, is a gulag. Three, two, one, out of the gate. That was a that was like a wild. That was like the fastest gun in the West recording. I don't think I've ever started recording that quickly. That might be a new record. <laughs> Fucking recording, bro. Um, but yeah, now did you get a haircut? Did you get a haircut? Well, uh, my bags. So you know what? It might be. You're right. It might be my audio. That's. I think. Worked. I think that's what it has to be. I okay. mean, on, 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 on my end, that's what it sounded like. But okay. but of course, you got to remember that I'm listening to it through another internet connection past that. Sure. Sure. Where you're sending that's, it to me. Fuck yeah! I'll just send you. The, I'll email you the two links. Yeah. It's. Uh, you know, it's it, it's the. I mean, it's it's. it's Hmm. How to phrase? Okay. Um, you can only lose data. You know, you can yeah, you yeah, yeah. lose lose fidelity. You know, yeah. you, now you you can do these fancy AI things that they're doing now to try and restore fidelity. Yeah. Uh, but what that does is it also introduces a bunch of artifacts and it's, yeah. it's not the actual original thing anymore. It's yeah. some artificial it, intelligence's impression of what the original thing should have been. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, I suspect what you, what you got going there is you, you've got a, a room with really crappy acoustics. Yeah. Okay. And that comes through. I was like, that was what what I was hearing in both of those was a lot of reflections, you know, from, okay. from the walls. And that's also true of this room uh, that I'm in. But I'm reducing it. the The main thing that I have that is keeping it to a dull roar is the fact that this microphone is two inches from my mouth. Mm -hmm. So that means that the crap reflected from the walls is uh, a lot less loud than the original sound yeah. but like if i was using the microphone and the computer yeah which a lot of people do a lot of your guests have obviously done yeah and you can hear that they're in like in this boom 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 echo chamber yeah they're in a big room or yeah and that's just because they're even in a normal room if you're two feet from the microphone and then the walls are 10 feet from you 
then the sound that gets reflected off of them is a significant fraction of the loudness of the actual sound that you've made the volume for. Okay. Uh, what makes this work is that the uh, the loudness, you know, the, the, the amplitude is turned down a lot because the microphone is two inches from my mouth. So that means the reflections from the walls are a lot. The fraction. The fra yeah, a small fraction of what I'm intending to pick up. But it means I have the exact opposite of the puff shield. It means you're getting all of my puffs and poofy <laughs> at full, you know, the stomach growling and you know and gurgling noises in my full volume and so, so should i be holding it like right here well it, you can you hear it better can, is my voice higher fidelity if i hold yes, it right actually it is really okay so then i need it but you're you're also puffing more noticeably okay i can hear the puffing more which okay. is why you need the puff shield so okay. what you should actually probably have is one of these stupid things and just and, you know, and get it mounted and just have it yeah right? have it mounted on your desk and uh you know with the microphone you know you, you you want you want this about six inches from uh the place where you normally uh speak from and then the microphone four to six inches beyond it okay and what that does is, is the puff shield takes care of the poof 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 things which uh, we're, yeah, the thing the thing about using the remote mic is you don't hear the poof 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 things sure. because they they don't go that the poofs don't go very far. Yeah. So what the poof shield is for is the fact that you have the microphone close to your mouth. Okay. But having the microphone close is about not having the room sounds and the environment okay. and all that. Okay. Yeah. But then you're gonna have to get some discipline about staying in one place because you're you know <laughs> i'll just get a seat belt <laughs> yeah right or i'll get some lasers pointing straight down it's kind of like the game operation they'll buzz if i lean too far yes away. you are here <laughs> or i should just yeah yeah i don't know it's definitely this is episode 280 definitely should have figured this out about 280 episodes ago but you know what <laughs> I've, uh, I think that's the nature of this podcast is just fuck it, do it live, and we'll, we learn as we go. Actually, a lot of the fun of this has been watching you kind of wing it and kind of get the, the handle yeah. on things. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it is one of, the, one of the reasons that I keep coming back is actually it's, it's fun watching you get the, the, the handle on things you, in the field and everything. That. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a very slow – I had this microphone for 50 episodes before I used it. <laughs> I now have this camera set up perfectly, but now it's at the wrong height. So I'm just like, well, it's over there now, but it's, I'll figure that well, out. Well, what, what, what you'll, your, your next step is to get an external camera so that you can mount the camera and the microphone and the puff shield and everything and get it all right. And it's not related to your computer anymore. Yeah. Well, that's what this one is, right? Is, mm -hmm. is that what you mean external camera? Like that's what it is. It's a lot. I have like a literal external. Like I have a GoPro. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of those things now are just as good as the one in your computer. I mean, in yeah. The, in most cases, they're better. No, no, they are. Yeah. The problem. The problem is is that you're, uh, you 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 need to get a studio oriented idea. You need you need to think of uh, the space that you're broadcasting from. Yeah. As a studio. Yeah. And ask yourself, what is the optimum place for everything? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a default thing when you're using a laptop. Uh, okay. You're looking at the screen, mm -hmm. which is what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in a lot of cases, you're, if, if, if I wasn't using these, then the microphone is right here next to the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that results in a lot of echoes unless I'm in an anechoic chamber or a room with, you know, uh, that, that absorbs all yeah. the sound reflections somehow. Now we have, we you know, when uh, Elaine, the re I mentioned that she had some narrations done when yeah. she was in the preps for that. The reason I have a studio quality microphone, whether it's working or not at the moment, um, is that she got it to you know, when she was thinking of doing narrations, 
And she worked out that the best place in our house to do it was in the walk-in closet in our master bedroom because there's clothes hung up on the racks on either side. So there's not a lot of echoey surfaces. It's quiet. It's well ins you know, insulated from everything. Unfortunately, it's also not climate controlled. So right now it's also cold as crap. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's probably where I would be going if I was going to actually do something like narrating Mopey to put it on Audible instead of doing it in this office because this office is an actual horrible place. For yeah, no, this room is probably like, like other than like the living room, this is probably like the most wide open room in like the house and it's just a terrible spot, but it's also like the only spot where it's like I can just come up here and use this as my room to do this shit mm -hmm. in so I'm not bothered. But yeah, no, the next step is definitely like going to be moving out this summer then that is like, so like, and I also like, I can't fuck around with my parents. On that? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, really though, this summer, yeah. Bumping out. So it's going to be badass. Yeah. Fucking leaving. Um, <laughs> but wherever I go, I'm going to have a room for this. I'll probably just end up getting like a two bedroom place. But what I want to do is I want to get something where I can put all that fucking absorbing shit on the walls. I, I have been told by someone who was in a position to know that moving blankets make really good sound absorbing uh, things. Really? Yeah. Uh, her, uh, she had a boyfriend who was a musician in a fast life. And so that was what they did is they got the moving blankets that they would use to line the moving vans. And uh, yeah. that was a really cheap version of the anti echo uh, yeah. wall coverings. Yeah. 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 It's going to be, Whatever I do in the new place, it's going to be badass. Because even this is like this, this has transformed dramatically. Just like even just the, sh the equipment I'm using. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I can't wait to have like a room that I can just yeah. throw balls in and, and do it with is. Yeah, well, Mit Mitzi hooked you up with a lot of that shit, didn't she? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I would say what, what you're going to need to do is once you bring the microphone close, then you're going to need the puff shield. Mm -hmm. That means you're going to need to actually have like a fixed place where you sit yeah. to do your part of the thing. Then you're going to have to figure out where you want the camera and the display that you're using so, you know, to, to show you to your guest and that you're looking on. Because like you said, right now, yeah. you, you put the camera at the closest thing that you can and, and you're like this and it's, it's not, it's jarring. So, mm -hmm. um, but there's solutions to all of that, obviously, you know, um, but, but you have to kind of go, well, instead of just doing this at random, uh, maybe it's time to actually think about laying this sucker out like a studio yeah. Yeah. and, uh, you know, because because you've got some decent equipment now, uh, it 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 really it's not necessary when you're just doing your laptop. Everyone kind of understands that you're just doing your laptop and that your voice is bouncing off the walls. I mean, I've seen like uh, fucking late night show. You know, you know, in the last you know in the COVID era, when you know they they uh, some celebrity and it's like they're obviously just using their laptop and their voice is bouncing off. That audio is terrible. Yeah, it happens with yeah. Joe, Joe Rogan's guests. He'll have on like Matthew McConaughey or like John Stewart, and you're just it's just such a weird departure from like studio quality, and it's yeah. like wow, it's it's noticeable. And 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 the thing is that there is a technology to to improving on that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. Yeah, and and I'll be honest, I didn't know about these things. In, I don't fucking know. That was my that was that was my wife who did all that research. Uh, yeah, I've uh, yeah I've always seen those and just not known what they are. Is um yeah well and and and, and that's that's the thing is because when you, you 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 put the microphone closer to your face to get rid of the environmental influences so that your voice dominates, but then also you start getting the poof, poof, poof things. Mm -hmm. And that's what the poof filter is for, mm -hmm. is, is, to, is to get rid of that when the microphone is that close to your face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely, I've, uh, I've come to think about like this whole setup I have, like a desk and a couple shelves. I've come to think of it as like this like single organism. Because at first it was just the laptop. 
and then it was a microphone and then the laptop went on uh, cooling fans and then I got a couple externals and then I made then I made like NORAD which is like it's like it's like brain not really it's like it's it's that's its long-term memory right that's like it's yeah. cerebellum or something you did your hard drive fetish yeah which <laughs> which is awesome right so those ones in there and then ones up here i showed you actually fuck it I'll, I'll connect this and show it to you um is uh you'll like it so it originally originally like i have all those ones in norad but it's it's a bitch to take out every day mm -hmm. so now i only i only update those once a week and uh so instead i have the the ones on the desktop and why is that image like yellow? Color temperature. That's weird. It's you. You went to incandescent lights from uh, probably fluorescent. Yeah. No. I mean, I turned all of them on earlier when I had it on. Whatever. Not important. And so I have all these right. Two in the center. Those are twelve each. Go out one, sixteen each, and then ten each. <laughs> right. Um, and then I have all of them hooked up to all these, uh, like USB port thingies. Can't really see it. It's kind of blurry. Yeah. I know what it is though. Yeah. And then there are all the things are connected to this one hub where it's just got one big button on the top. And so now what I've done is, uh, so I've hooked them all up together. I see your cut, your camera corrected the color temperature problem. Yeah, finally. Um, I put them all together, hooked them all up together, and then I have them all leading to just one USB-C. So now I can just click that in and I just press the big comically big button on top and it all, <laughs> and I have a, uh, I have a cooling pad under it. So there's like this, it starts, you know, dissipating all the heat just from all the hard drives next to each other. So that's like the brain of it. And so I've been for a while, it's just been this organism, right? It's got its eyes, different cameras. It's got its ears, right? Different microphones. Now it's got, it's got a backup brain, and then it's got the 76 terabyte brain right there. Xbox over here, which is in a way, it's like how I bring in the information because I play video games muted while listening to audiobooks. So that's part of the organism. Mm -hmm. The big 4K TV right here, router down here. But it's all kind of, you know, not everything's connected. But for the past couple months, I've been viewing it as this one, you know, it's like they say with like a fighter jet, they say you strap yourself into the jet. In a mm -hmm. way, it's like I come and I sit in here and it's like I lock into this whole thing, whether I'm like yes. extracting the information. Have you, have, have, have you looked behind me uh, recently? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, so I've been looking at all this as just one organism. Yeah. This this is what happens when you've been doing that for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> now I have shit I haven't thrown away, but I, I, I make sure to put it all. I, I, I have shit that I actually uh, took out of television sets that I pulled off the side of the road when I was a kid in the 70s that I still have. Jesus. At, uh, you know, it's, it's like... On the one hand, what am I what am I ever going to do with a five watt one mega ohm resistor? On the other hand, if I suddenly realize that I need it and I've thrown it away, and that has happened. Oh me no! It, so it, many it, times. It is a law. In in the, <laughs> in the in the drawers of this desk, I have like a almost have like a duffel bag full of just like old iPhone adapters and who knows how many HDMI cables and chargers, but I don't throw them away because it's understood that if you throw them away, you will have a need for it. So if you Next just week. keep them in a way, you're saving Next week. Them. Yeah. But, so in a way, it's almost <laughs> like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's like by keeping <laughs> these, the universe removes your need for them. Yeah, that's, I mean, I mean, all, all, all I can say is that I, I, I can't even count the number of times that I've, I've, I've thrown something away that I haven't, Some you know, EGA that adapt. I've had for 15 years. Yeah. It's like, there's no time. I, I'm not going to, I'm never going to use this. Yeah. And then, then it's like the very next week. Oh, I need a, oh, fuck. I just threw that yeah. out. It's some absurd. It's like, I, do I have my sand disk to, to <laughs> macro USB? <laughs> cord and it's like that was for like one specific digital camera in 2003 yeah don't you dare throw that away because my god
you're going to find yourself going, I wonder if I, nope. Yeah. By a uh, MMC reader or something. It was like, you know, Oh, that, that just, Oh yeah. Look at that. It's like, yeah. Remember yeah. these? That was, that was for one particular digital camera. Uh huh. That camera is behind me. Yeah. It hasn't worked for years, but I, I'm not going to throw it away just yet because yeah, it's still, yeah. But but it's like you know, uh, the thing is that format. There's there's a bunch of stuff, uh, especially out in, in in industry where they keep stuff for longer than we do in consumer land. That I might need that for. It's yeah. like that's the only one I have. So whatever yeah my my hopes are as i keep adding to this organism this digital organism i hope that that eventually in like 2030 it becomes like self-aware <laughs> just ever increasing complexity right isn't that isn't that a theory about consciousness is like the more complex conscious obviously it's all based in nothing but it's like well, the the thing is that uh, what they're lacking there is algorithms. They they don't know how consciousness works, yeah. Yeah. and uh, there are different individuals and groups who are treating that as a problem. Uh, but even treating that as a serious problem is only is is a, actually a fairly new thing because people are so weird about it. Um, just the idea that consciousness is a solvable problem yeah. that machines can do. There, there are people who are just like actually literally religiously opposed to the idea that it is possible at all. Yeah. They, they think this is no, this is some special thing that, you know, uh, mere humans couldn't possibly duplicate. And I'm I'm sorry, you know, it's like uh, to me, I call bullshit on that because human beings are made of matter, yeah. And that means that matter is capable of expressing consciousness, yeah. and that means we should be able to put together an assemblage of matter that also expresses consciousness. That should yeah. be a thing that is possible. I mean, uh, we, we do it through childbirth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, well, they have this idea that there is some strange, weird ectoplasm yeah. that science can't detect that is yeah. being. That, that, that I, I don't yeah i don't go for that That's, yeah um, yeah we can do it we don't know how we just know it's just like we just, don't know how yet that's yeah. you know but we didn't know how to build a computer at all 100 years ago yeah. yeah oh yeah no sure no man will never fly right it's yeah um in in fact this is uh close to the 100th anniversary of the computable numbers paper i think Really? Which, which laid the foundation. That was Alan Turing's seminal paper that laid the foundation for everything computer related ever. Oh. Um, yeah, I want to say he did that in the 20s. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, because cause I know it was in the teens that they were doing the. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were doing the futile thing to unify math. That turned out to be such a laugh. What the hell was that? That was not good. Oh, like I said, names of things go out of my head. If I don't, if I don't prep for, for a topic, then yeah, I know what I'm talking about, but I don't know what to call it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, there was a a big uh, drive to to like prove that all of math, starting with arithmetic, was self evident that that it uh, that it proved itself. And the they ended up doing the exact opposite. <laughs> um, the, uh, the this was it was it was it was like the thing with uh, non Euclidean geometry. They uh, they they wanted to prove that Euclidean geometry was uh, self evident and that it was complete and pure. And when they went to prove that this, they ended up proving the exact opposite, which is that other geometries are possible. And not only that, the universe we live in is not Euclidean. <laughs> what, is, what does Euclidean mean? It basically means uh, the, the system of, of postulates and uh, theorems based on what you think of as like two and three dimensional uh, pure Cartesian coordinates 
where, uh, you know, like parallel lines never meet, you know, things like that. Okay, and uh, in the real world, it turns out that lines that are parallel can meet because space is not flat. Mm -hmm. so, so basically Euclidean geometry is a geometry of space that is completely flat and doesn't have any curves or bumps or interruptions. Uh, so, you know, there are no black holes in a Euclidean universe. Mm -hmm. So um, the, you know, you know ba basically all the stuff that you were taught about the angles of a triangle add up to 180, you know, well, and there's, there's a good one because that's not even true on the surface of the earth because the earth is a sphere. Mm -hmm. Flat earthers notwithstanding. Um, the, uh, the ancients thought that geometry was pure and beyond reproach. Um, they had a lot of weird ideas like that, but um, <laughs> what the thing is that if, if you were coming from the fourth century BC and discovering these ideas and making them work together, then it was almost like a religious epiphany, how well all of these mathematical ideas work together. And so they formed the idea that this must be the fundamental truth of the universe. Yeah. And of course, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but in the fourth century BC, there was nothing to tell you about that. And so, you know, all of these ideas that we got through Aristotle uh, that trickled down to the monasteries in the Middle Ages before they were rediscovered in the Renaissance. And it was only then that we started to discover they're not always true. Um, so, uh, well, that was deep. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've always heard that. I've always heard Euclidean, and I don't I never knew what it meant. Well, you, you, Euclid is one of the guys who did a lot of the major shit for geometry mm -hmm. back in in ancient Greece, mm -hmm. and so he he's up there with uh, Aristotle and Socrates and those guys. Um, the uh, thing we knew from him, um, Pythagoras, of course, the Pythagorean theorem about sure. the James. Okay, the Pythagorean theorem. That that works in in the context of Euclidean geometry. Okay. So uh, it turns out that the Pythagorean theorem does not actually work in real space. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Curved. because real because real space is curved. It's not you know, it doesn't in fact it doesn't work on the surface of the earth. Yeah. Because the earth is not flat. Yeah. It's curved. So you can have, if you, if you draw a triangle whose vertices are 90 degrees apart on the equator and the other one is at the North Pole, then the angles don't add up to 180. They, they uh, you know, because, because it's, on, it's on a sphere. <laughs> I'm just happy. <laughs> This happens every once in a while, but right now I'm getting it. <laughs> Do you ever just really realize like the earth isn't sitting on anything? Huh? I mean, like, not like, not that you know the knowledge. I mean, it's kind of the way I described it is like, you know, when like a plane's taken off and you kind of get that like lurch in your stomach, but then once you, st once the plane's at cruising altitude and you're just kind of chugging along, you fall asleep, wake up, have a Diet Coke, you use the restroom. You don't really think anything of it, right? You might need to put your hand on a, on a chair as you move down the aisle, but it's pretty, but you're still flying. Even if you're not feeling that stomach churning up, we're lifting up. Yeah. It's like, we don't feel that right now. We just feel like normal earth, but that doesn't mean that it's like we're any less flying. And whenever I think about that, I start to get this weird balancing sensation that like, it's almost like if I kick hard enough, I can like push the earth away from me. Like I'm in space. I, I can tell you the, the best, the best way to get uh, that sensation is a lot of marijuana, a fucking big old pop brownie. 
Well, that doesn't hurt. That, that, that but what hurt. I was actually going to say is to lie on your back and look at the sky during the meteor shower. Oh yeah. Like uh, yeah. one of, like the Perseids, one of the one of the big meteor showers. If you if you can get it when it's really rich and you've got a meteor or, or, or two going every second, then you can actually get a sense of the Earth's motion through space. Yeah. As it is flying through Ooh. the swarm of meteors. Uh, oh shit! I didn't think about <laughs> it. I'm just imagining. Oh, I've actually done that, and it is wild. Yeah. Dude, it's it's. I used to, Arecibo. The reason I know that is because me and my roommate we used to get high as fuck and watch this one video on YouTube called um, it was uh, it's called Atacama. I think it's called like Atacama Desert. No, no, the song is Arecibo by Carbon Based Life Forms. They have a bunch of like long, kind of like synthy, very kind of trippy, not like hippie, but just very like new age, like, new age music is the word you're looking for. I think kind of, I think, but they like they said it to they said it's like a time lapse, the Milky Way in the Atacama Desert, and yeah. like, the way you see it moving, you start to get the sensation that you're like, oh fuck, like I'm not looking at this flat, like there are the stars. It's you know, it's like yeah. there's depth to that you're looking at things mm -hmm. that are closer but i never thought so you just said that we're moving through the meteor shower so it's like it's like when you're in a car driving during a snowstorm at night and you see that's the, exactly like what it's like except it's the, the entire snow. earth Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so you're just laying there and just whoop. And, and, and there's just still like the the I, I don't know if you're uh <laughs> familiar with the uh in fact, now 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 the, the the word has left my head again. But the uh, there's a point in the sky that all the meteors seem to be coming from. Okay. Okay. And and they'll they'll tell you that you know. It'll come to me in a second. But um, but uh, that that's you can tell that that's where we're going in the sky. Yeah, right. During a meteor shower, if 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 That's, if it's if it's okay. a good rich one like the Perseids and a nice clear night, and uh, now I'll tell you another one that freaked out a, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, I, I'm still fucking trying to internalize this one. Uh, what one of one of the other things is is uh, I have a four uh, a four inch telescope, and uh, years and years ago we took it out to uh, this little New Age club that uh you know this new age bookstore where we had a little reading group and uh we took it out to just sort of show it off and uh, there was a good couple of good planetary things going on at the time but one of the things is that if you're if you have a telescope that has significant magnification and you don't have uh an equatorial drive then as you're looking through it, you see the stars moving like that. And that's the Earth's rotation. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the Earth's rotation yeah. as, as it sweeps the sky. And there was this one girl who was like, holy shit, when I pointed that out to yeah. her. <laughs> oh, no, dude, it's – that realization you have, it, it changes – and for me, it has like such this profound impact. Like what you're describing as meteor showers. All of a sudden, we're moving through that, and then the realization that the whole mm -hmm. Earth is moving. It all of a sudden, it just like blossoms into every aspect of my life. It's like, what are countries? We're just on different spots of this big dirt ball, and it's yeah. like, what is going? What are what are you know different time zones? It's like these are just these. You start to almost see them projected on the sky, kind of like Mopey seeing the stars up there. It's like <laughs> you see these projected time zones, and it's like, what the fuck? Is going on and then even if you got to think you know another way i like to think about it isn't that like we're on the earth and the sun is up in the sky but i like to think of it as like um the sun is like a is like a ball of like fire over the middle of manhattan and what you are is you are on the side of like a good year blimp and you're looking at it and there's this big chasm between you like that's one way I like to think of it is like we're stuck on like the surface, almost like we're on a, like on a Velcro <laughs> suit stuck on a wall. And it's like we're looking at it, this thing, and there's just infinity below us and above us, and it's it starts to it all for me. It's not just like it changes. If you can't tell, it fucking just rips my mind into pieces, and I love it. 
Well, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a total change of perspective. And you know, you're, you're used to thinking of the earth as split between the, the earth below you and the sky above and the sun goes around once a day and all. And it's like, if you think about it, it's noon somewhere. Yeah. It's always noon somewhere. Yeah. That's, that's why there's time zones. That's what I think about. If you just went into space and just like got in geosynchronous orbit, like you could technically, like if you go into space, there's no day. If you just get out far enough and you just look, like imagine if you're just a giant, like the size of like the solar system and you're just observing it in your hand, there's no day or night. You're just always looking at the sun just burning away and the planets moving. You're just like, oh, cool. Uh-huh. There's no day. It's just, there's it's always day. day. It's just it. There's always day. Yeah. There's al <laughs> it's always day. Uh, and, and, and unless the earth gets in between you and the sun and then it's an eclipse. It's, yeah. But even then, if you were, a, if you were big enough, it wouldn't even be an eclipse. It would just kind of be, <laughs> you'd see kind of like the shadow beam from it. You'd be like, huh. But it's like, that's so insane. It's like, there is no day. Yeah. It's just and sunny. And then where's the solar system? Because it's orbiting around yeah, the uh, yeah, center of the galaxy. Yeah, and then where's that fuck and, going, right? Local and cluster. the galaxy is going to collide with another galaxy in a couple billion yeah. years. Yeah, Andromeda. Yeah, and we're in the local group, and the local group is in the Virgo supercluster, and all of those are in some big thing that kind of looks like a weird organism called L Lanakea. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's like Because you know, there's like the great attractor, and uh -huh. there's all these big super massive con you know, clusters, yeah and the the universe isn't even really old enough for a lot of those gravitational interactions to have expressed themselves fully so yeah that's why we have filaments and shit yeah, like they call it the great wall right isn't that mm -hmm. one of them the filaments the galactic filaments that are made yeah. of super clusters yeah and it's like yeah no a super cluster is itself no we we have like uh one of one of the big things that they did recently, uh, this was uh, it, it would be hilarious, except that it's, it's serious, is that there's a supernova that happened like 10 billion light years away yeah. that we've observed four times. And we could predict when it was going to happen and we could observe it again because we were seeing it gravitationally lensed around a super cluster of galaxies. And because the gravitational lens isn't symmetric, there's multiple paths oh. by which the light comes to us. And so this one takes, now think about that, a 10 billion years, this light has been traveling, but this path took 10 years longer than this path. <laughs> I knew about using the sun as a gravitational lens i never thought of using a gal super cluster of galaxies they've done a lot of work like that in the last 10 years it's <laughs> it's really so so they you know so the upshot was that they knew this type one supernova was uh was they going you know, to happen they had seen it happen and they knew from one of the other gravitational lensing pathways that it looked like the same thing was going to be observable. So they were able to have the telescopes fixed on it when it happened. And so we got some of like the earliest observations ever of the spectrography of these, of, 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 a, of a supernova just going off. And it, it's, you know, oh, it's I, astronomy in the last decade has been just like full of wonders and it's been nuts. Fuck, and then you gotta think, imagine if we could still view, like, the planets around it before it went off, knowing it's going off, and it's like, what if you could use electron entanglement where it happens instantaneously? Could we tell them, like, hey, get off your planet, we just want supernova. Like, are we in the future? Well, actually, that kind of supernova isn't going to have planets with life on them, because those stars don't live long okay. enough. Okay, okay. Uh, stars that live long enough to have life evolve around them, like our sun, are going to last billions of years, uh, but they're not going to become supernova. Okay. They're, going, uh, they're going to become normal nova, yeah. and there's going to be all kinds of warning because they're going to become red giants yeah. first. Yeah, right. Yeah, and there are so. different types of nova, super. Isn't there a hypernova? Um, Where there's no core left, the entire fucker just... Not connecting there, but but there there is there is they they use the word nova to describe the collision of two neutron stars. They came up with some name for that, and that turns out to be where all the heavy heavy elements in the universe come from that we couldn't figure out 
more than a few years ago where they were coming from. Um, a, a hypernova is a very energetic supernova thought to result from an extreme core collapse scenario. In this case, a massive star collapses to form a black hole. So I guess also known as a well, my, also known as a super luminous uh, supernova. So technically, it's still so it's just a type of it's yeah it's, it's, it's probably like a type one yeah. A instead of a type one a burst fifty to a, a burst five to fifty times more energetic than a normal supernova. So it's but it's still a, a supernova. But that means that it's also a much bigger star, which means it's a star that didn't live very long because the bigger the star is, the shorter its lifetime. Kind of like dogs. I was about um, to say <laughs> or a lot or like or like musicians, right? <laughs> Right, the bigger this, right? The Twenty Seven Club, Kurt Cobain, Mac Miller, Jimi Hendrix, right? Keith, Keith Richards wants to have a word with you. Well, Keith Richards has clearly he. <laughs> that's how we know that he is artificial, right? That's <laughs> how, for that matter, Mick Jagger. Yeah, no, Keith Richards is definitely. <laughs> or it just means when he does. Or what if he dies at seventy? Maybe that's just proof that he is actually of a species of gods that lives till ten thousand. So seventy is technically still young. Or I 80. think I think I think dying at seventy is off the table for both of them at this point. Of oh, an well, eighty, ninety, whatever, ninety. What if he dies? <laughs> at, but what, that that might just be proof that Keith Richards is of a god tier race that lives to a hundred thousand years old. So dying at ninety is still actually young. Or they're either vampires or zombies. That's not entirely out of the out of the realm of possibility, <laughs> and I like where your head's going. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm uh, I'm doing the Netflix DVD jamming thing right now of the True Blood series, and, uh, which oh, it is fantastic, yeah. and it, and it's hilarious because it's set in Louisiana, <laughs> so it's uh, there there's part local color and part local hilarity. It's like no, I've been to Shreveport. It doesn't look like that. It, <laughs> Um, I should have pulled this up earlier. Might as well read it now, right? Former Israeli space security. We're two hours in. Meant to. Here's the topic. <laughs> well, fuck it. You know what? This might just be why Roger and I need to stick to topics. Former Israeli space security chief says extraterrestrials exist and Trump knows about it. This is on NBCNews.com. A galactic federation has been waiting for humans to, quote, reach a stage where we'll understand what space and spaceships are. Um, I hmm. think, I, I think we understand. I thought we met those criteria. Yeah. So now the Federation's moving the goalposts. They're like, well, it, and, you know, we're like, we have them. No, we have a space shuttle. Look at our, like, I, like, like I said, I didn't just read this short story. I wrote it. it yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, <laughs> they're coming, they're coming to, they're moving the goalposts. They're like, well, you don't know what space is because now air C was broken. So technically we're like, that's some bullshit. We've had it though. And they're like, nope, broken. You can't join. Yeah, yeah and it's you like don't have, you don't you, have a working air seat belt. Sorry, you notice the garbage patch floating above the Earth in orbital space. That you know, it's it's like I think we've been spacefaring for a while now. We've littered a lot. Yeah, the former Israeli space security chief said, has sent I mean, I that's it. If you've polluted a place, then you own it. Moon, Mars, ours. <laughs> that's ours, dude. The Venus too. We have garbage on Venus. Goddamn fucking right. Actually, <laughs> and then, yeah, well, we never landed anything. Oh, I don't know. Yes, we did. The Russians no, the no, Russians no, 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 landed no, no. on Venus. I'm not talking about Venus. I'm talking about Jupiter. We've crashed. Well, you, well we've they've crashed. Burned, they've burned up, though, right? Yeah, we fra well, we crashed uh, shit into both Jupiter and Saturn. Pluto, we just flew by, right? Yes, Pluto, we just flew by. But we crashed uh, the... Cassini, Huygens, Huggins. Cassini, Cassini, yeah, we we crashed Cassini into Saturn, oh. and I'm pretty sure we crashed uh, at least one of the Jupiter spacecraft into Jupiter. That uh, there's probably nothing of those right left, right? Oh no, there, yeah. Well, there's there's nothing from the land. Uh, they go just down until it's like neutronium or something. It's yeah, like, what the fuck is at the center of Jupiter? Can you fly through Jupiter? I mean, if you were, you know, made of like. In, in I've seen the speculation that it's metallic. It's an ocean of metallic hydrogen. I fucking that's so awesome. <laughs> of course, Jupiter's like I don't even have normal ground. I just have a a ball of metallic hydrogen. What the yeah. fuck? And at the center of the ball of metallic hydrogen is a diamond the size of Earth. 
Fuck. Because the carbon rains down, because car, carbon is yeah. heavier than hydrogen. Yeah. So the carbon what? collects at the middle, and because the pressure is so high, it creates a diamond. At least that's what some people think. That that let's put it this way. That's what Arthur C. Clarke wrote into the 2010 series thing. Yeah. So that's good enough for me. So maybe if the sun goes like supernova, maybe it will blow away all the gas and there'll just be a beautiful diamond. Yeah. Well, actually what happened in 20, uh, in 2010 uh, was Arthur C. Clarke had the alien monolith uh, turn, hydro, uh, turn Jupiter into a star by uh, mm -hmm. uh, making it more dense so yeah. that it would be able to undergo fusion, even though it's not quite big enough, so that Europa could have land-based uh -huh. life. Uh, and in 2064, one of the things they find is that there's all these massive diamonds all over the place from the original core of Jupiter having been blown out during the explosion. That's I love that story of like uh, alien life came to the solar system and they collapsed the giant planet known as the sun and said, let there be light. Mm-hmm. I love that idea. That's like, yeah, they just. I hope this is how it turns up. That this is that this is what's happening. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I that I was planning to read you a story today, and that story is about alien gifts. Really. the The name of the story is the fifth gift. Well, that's what we're gonna do the next episode. Then. It's. I wanted to talk. I'm trying to pull up the article. I wanted to talk about. Um, well, no, we talked about what I wanted to talk about, so I'm, I'm happy with that. But I felt yeah. like we needed, I felt like we needed to get this episode out while it was still 2020. Yeah, well, it's it's topical. Yeah. So yeah. Normally, normally, I don't really give a fuck about. I wouldn't push back a normal episode with you, but I was like, you know what? I just want to, on the off chance that the thing happens. And well, we and I also it. saw you managed to snag a best-selling author to take my slot on Pearl Harbor Day. So. <laughs> Is you texted me at noon? It's like we're gonna go see you at see you at five, bitch. And then you, at oh, like two o'clock, yeah. you texted me, and it's like, can we reschedule for Wednesday? Oh no, <laughs> Jerome Corsi. Yeah, no, I had him on. I had him on at one. Yeah, I had him on, and I was just, and then I had on before you today. I had on Ben Westoff, who wrote Fentanyl Inc., which is a good book. And tomorrow I have. Um, that does sound good. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I can't remember his first name. Burton who is a CIA counterintelligence agent. And I got to finish that book up tonight and I have him tomorrow. But yeah, Monday, it was just like one, two, three. And I was just knocking out these books. And I was just like, I didn't want to do an episode. Because kind of what you said, not perfectionist, but I don't want to put out shit. I was yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to show up on a Monday evening and be like, what's up, Roger? And just kind of like, I'd rather <laughs> not do an episode than do a shitty episode, you know? I was just, I got to a point where I was like, I just need to sleep. I'm with you. So. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But, so anyway, it takes me about half an hour to read the story. So if you are interested in hearing about alien gifts, since that is kind of the topic of today's podcast, fuck I'll it. go ahead and do it. Fuck it. Let me go take a piss and then let's do this. All right. Uh, yeah. I'll call yeah. it up then. Yeah. Fuck okay.
Roger Williams. <laughs> okay. So this story has a little bit of a history. I originally wrote this in the 1980s and through multiple moving computers lost it. And in 2005, I reconstructed it and published it on Corrosion. Uh, it's kind of an apology to some uh, people on there for another essay that I had written that uh, ticked a few people off. Well, you know Talk what? about that sometime. <laughs> you know what? They can eat a dick. Because <laughs> remember all the listeners right now, just in case you've forgotten, if Roger doesn't have 340 million book purchases by midnight tonight, <laughs> I will start killing a hostage every hour. Then that, that ought to get you through the entire human race in about... Okay, let me reword that. I will kill at least, <laughs> I will kill at least one hostage an hour, all right? All right, now, now you're sounding like right, the, uh, the aliens from The Simpsons that, yeah. you know... <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is The Fifth Gift, originally published Saturday, August 20th, 2005. On corrosion.org. Oh, August 20th, 2003. That was like my third week of high school. Mm. Not that you asked. <laughs> okay. So, making a new tunic reminded me of how far I had to go. I was using a lock stitching awl, which was a manufactured artifact, and waxed cotton thread, which was not of my own making. The leather was mine. I had killed the pig, skinned it, and tanned it tied myself. I had colored it with soot and vegetable dyes, but I had used a razor knife to cut it, more technology. One day I would have to take up flint napping. I wanted nothing to do with the world of other humans or their tools, but my childhood was spent working toward the PhD I would eventually receive in physics, not learning the survival arts any hunter-gatherer would take for granted. Still, I had made much progress. I sowed and I planted. I kept my own seasonal calendar. I hunted and I preserved and prepared my own food. I built and thatched my own small cabin. I did not use electricity or refined fuel. It was a calming way to live, and I was more physically fit than I had ever been. It was almost possible sometimes to forget that I was never really alone. But while I was making my new tunic, the phone rang. The Iridium satellite phone spends its days connected to a little solar panel that keeps it charged. It's the one bit of high technology I cannot get rid of. If, I were ever, if it were ever to ring and I were to fail to answer it, I would not be the only one to die. I'm here, I said irritably. The helicopter is on its way, be ready. An hour later, I was flying, an old dream of men we have managed to turn into a terrifying boar. The pilot and guards didn't know who I was or why I had been summoned. They had only been told to kill me if I offered any resistance. But if it isn't Daniel Boone, Agent Smith said mockingly as I jumped out. I waited for the chopper to be gone before answering. I take it there's another one. Of course, why would we annoy ourselves with your troublesome presence otherwise? The first gift. The first time I had met Smith and Jones, I was still young enough to be idealistic and patriotic, and their offer to let me help my country seemed like a wonderful opportunity. After I signed all the forms and passed the tests, I was taken to this remote and nearly empty facility in Idaho, where I became the ninth person in the entire world to learn of the gift. It had been left outside the door of a farmer who lived near Indianola, Mississippi. It was an artifact, a solid cubic box about 20 centimeters on a side and with a small array of pure copper posts sticking out of one face. It came with a small booklet written in a dense, confusing mix of technical jargon, maths, and attempted explanations in several human languages. None of the other eight people who knew about it could make sense of this instruction manual, but I found that it made a certain kind of weird sense to me. I had been working on the problem for a week when I learned that the family who had received it were all dead. It wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to know, but it impressed on me the seriousness of what I was doing. The aliens called the box a matter generator, but we'd be more inclined to call it a matter duplicator. 
By connecting switches and potentiometers between the copper posts, it was possible to make the box mark off two cubic rectangular areas of volume. Make a certain contact and these areas would be isolated within perfectly reflective fields. They could be expanded or contracted by altering resistances between the other posts. As I worked out the user interface, I built a little control panel for it. It was actually a clever way for the aliens to do things. Instead of trying to build controls we could use, they built us an interface we could attach to controls that made sense to us. It could also be automated. Once you had made the contact that established the shielded volumes, if you made another certain contact, the contents of the first volume were copied to the second. The machine copied metal, plastic, steel, and diamond with equal ease. Copies of copies of copies of copies were indistinguishable from the originals at any magnification, even using techniques like X-ray crystallography. The machine would also make copies of itself. The copies worked exactly the same way the original did. Smith and Jones wanted to know where the copies came from. The instructions were quite clear on that. Once you penetrated the alien jargon, they were created whole. The matter was not taken from some other place in the universe. It was made by the matter generator. The generators also didn't seem to require a power source. They were powered by whatever first principle generated the copies. Nor was there any obvious limit on their use. A single such device could yield an endless stream of oil, fresh water, cool air, or any other commodity of interest, not to mention an endless stream of perfectly manufactured goods based on a single carefully built prototype. It did have limitations. It wouldn't copy living things, although it would copy dead things and food. It wouldn't copy certain intensely radioactive elements, and it would copy any radionuclide to its most stable and common isotope. Copies of bits of wood emerged containing no carbon-14 at all. Copies of old radium-dialed wristwatches did not glow. Copies of chemical high explosive did, however, explode quite normally. The matter generator itself seemed to be made of ordinary enough matter, which was presumably why it was able to copy itself. Chemically, it was a hard semiconductive ceramic material. If you drilled into one of them more than a couple of millimeters, it would stop working. But no matter how we destroyed them, there was no indication of dangerous energy stored within. The electron microscope revealed a very detailed but wholly mysterious structure at nanometer scale. When I had learned all that I could, Smith and Jones locked all the matter generators and their copies and all the copies of things we had made and warned me that if I told any about this, they would die. I protested that it was an awesome opportunity we were throwing away with this technology we could remake and clean up our entire world. And Smith smiled and warned me that my enthusiasm made them suspicious and any friends of mine who might have been told of my work might have to be eliminated on principle. What sane reason could there be for locking this thing up instead of using it? I demanded. Suppose we do remake our world with these things. Then suppose one day they all stop working. Can we risk that? You tell me we have no way to even begin to know how they work. Can we know that they aren't booby trapped in some way? Unless we do know that, we have to make sure nobody even learns that they exist because this is too seductive. It really is too good to be true. It was a good point which I'd eventually take to heart. Present day. This one has two terminals, Jones said. The instructions are even more opaque than usual. I'll handle that, I said, and they looked at me sharply. It irritated them to need me. This one was found in the central square of a village west of Veracruz, Mexico. A village square, eh? That must have been awkward. It's too bad you don't take the news. You might have heard about the terrible industrial accident they had down there. It sent a cloud of poison gas. There's a reason I don't take the news, I snapped, and Jones smiled wickedly. The second gift. When the second gift was found, I had already made myself alone. I had found a reason to break up with Jennifer and had distanced myself from all my old university friends. Somewhere there was a Swiss bank account with a large amount of money that was allegedly mine, but I had also inherited my parents' modest estate, and I was living on that in an apartment near Spokane, Washington. I found the mountain view refreshing. This gift had two very large fat terminals on opposite sides of the cubic box, and a small terminal central to them on a third face. 
I gleaned from the documentation that if I applied a voltage between either large terminal and the small one, the same voltage would appear between the two large terminals, up to 720 volts at 515 amperes. This was a much simpler gift than the first gift, but the first gift was central to its utility, for the matter generator could generate copies of the energy generator, and they could be gained in series and parallel. Using 10 of them in parallel, I made a piece of rebar glow like the filament of a light bulb, flashing incandescent white before it melted. Using them in series, I made lightning play across the shop parking lot. Using three of them, since the building had three-phase power, I used a little battery-powered oscillator to tickle them into powering our entire facility. This was just a parlor trick, I explained to Smith & Jones, that with enough of these, you could easily replace every power plant in the world because they could be distributed where they were needed. You could also get rid of the ugly and expensive distribution grid we used to move electricity around. One of these boxes would power an entire city block. A couple dozen of them would power even the hungriest industrial processes. But again, I got the lecture about becoming too dependent on something we didn't understand. When I allowed as to how we might be a little too important to keep to ourselves, Smith told me very gently that they had grave doubts about my dedication to the secrecy clause in my contract. In particular, they worried that I might have let Jennifer know too much. If they got too worried, Jennifer would have to die. I took the hint, but I also took another lesson. It wasn't just alien gifts I decided might not be trustworthy and I started looking for a place where I could be alone. present day. The gift with two terminals sat on a lab table. The lab was exactly as I had left it two years before. Nobody else ever went there. The other gifts, the copies made by the matter generators and so on, were stored in glass cabinets at the far end of the room. I started reading, or rather scanning, the booklet. The aliens didn't seem to understand our culture very well, which was one of the more worrisome things about their gifts. How could they know that these powerful things would not harm us? Their poor understanding of our own communication methods was not encouraging. After some brainstorming, I realized this was some kind of field generator. Short out the terminals and the field would be established. I wasn't too clear on what the field was supposed to do, but one thing was very clear. It would encompass our entire planet and probably our moon as well. When I told Smith and Jones this, they became very dour. I'm not sure we can risk testing it then, Smith said. I'll have to check upstairs. Upstairs would mean one of the other six people who knew about all this shit. Well, if they wanted to destroy us, they could have made the very first box do that. Do you want me to keep working on the purpose of this field? Oh, absolutely. But under no conditions, try to test it. This could very well be the thing we fear most. I understand. The third gift. By the time the third gift was found, I was living high in the mountains of Washington State, far from the nearest road. I was still pretty dependent on technology. I cheated a bit and used a chainsaw to build my cabin, but I had gotten books and was practicing the skills I'd need to survive on my own. While I was working on my cabin, though, Smith arrived by helicopter with a gift of his own. It was the Iridium phone with its solar charger. He allowed as to how a bit of solitude might help my demeanor. He elaborated that a reliable communication link would help me and all my old friends live to a nice old age. The third gift was called a force generator. It had a pair of terminals on each face. Establishing a low resistance path between the terminals would cause the box to generate a force pushing away from that face. The maximum force corresponding to a dead short would be nearly 10,000 pounds. Just bridging a pair of terminals with your fingers would make it slide away across the desktop. I sent Jones out to find an old car, and we spent an afternoon gutting the engine compartment and mounting a copy of the force generator to the frame. With an old game controller replacing the accelerator, the car would silently do zero to 60 in less than three seconds. Since the maximum force was greater than the weight of the car, it would pull itself easily out of gullies and mud. The maximum speed was limited only by the tires and suspension. I pegged the speedometer at 120 miles an hour several times. Like the other gifts, it didn't seem to require fuel or maintenance. I spent some time with the force generator trying to figure out how it sensed the control resistance. 
I couldn't detect any sense voltage across the terminals or any current flow when they were shorted, even with my most sensitive instruments. But then a technology that could create matter, energy, and force out of thin air might not need the usual methods to create to measure electrical resistance. When Smith and Jones were satisfied that I had learned all I could, I went back to my cabin without complaining about the benefits such a device could have for humanity. Humanity had already betrayed my expectations far more effectively than any aliens might hope to, and I didn't really care anymore. Present day. This is the key passage, I said as Smith and Jones looked on stonily. Within the field established by this device, the functioning of any self-directed goal-seeking information processing system is optimized. Then there's a lot of math, which would probably be of a lot of interest to anyone doing AI research. Self-directed goal-seeking what, Smith said. What are they talking about, our computers? No, I said, I think they're talking about us. The fourth gift. The fourth gift was different. It was small, a personal thing not meant to be industrialized. It was the size of a stopwatch, flat and round, with a big flat contact on one side. The working was simple but vague. It claimed to generate a zone of safety around any person whose skin was in contact with its single electrode. Safety from what, Jones asked sensibly. There are a lot of suggestions, high velocity impactors, bullets, fists, I'm not sure. Also a lot about the atmosphere, apparently it keeps the air pure and excludes harmful radiation. Electromagnetic or nuclear radiation? Might be both. Testing it will be risky. If we get test subjects, you'll kill them after the tests, won't you? Smith and Jones looked at one another. There isn't much choice. Then I'll test it. We need your skills. Not so much that you wouldn't kill me if I didn't answer the phone. Smith shrugged. It's a bad situation. Test it yourself then, but try to be careful. Your voice just drips with a concern for my welfare. But I was careful. It did indeed repel kinetic attacks. Anything that would like, be likely to form a bruise was repelled. I worked my way up from the thwack of a ruler to more robust weapons, finally asking Smith to shoot me. I think he enjoyed that test a little too much. The bullet stopped dead about half an inch from my skin and fell to the floor. There was no force pushing me back, and it didn't bounce. Yet the amulet did not seem to interfere with normal activities like touching and manipulating things or eating. I'm going to give this thing a real test, I announced after a couple of weeks. I don't expect you to like this, but I'm going to do it. They watched warily as I pulled an old large pallet board out of the shipping bay and bolted three force generator copies to it. I pulled the passenger seat out of the force generator powered car and bolted it to the center of the pallet. And I bolted a couple of large boxes to the front corners flanking the front force generator. I needed controls for what I planned to do and thinking of where I was going to be going, I used my TI-83 graphing calculator. I told Smith and Jones that I wanted certain gauges and the next morning a large box arrived packed with the things I'd asked for. By the second evening, after I had my idea, I was ready to try it. A flying car, Smith said dryly. I'd never have thought of that. It might be more than that, I said, making sure the safety generator was solidly taped to my thigh. Maybe a lot more. I tapped keys and the pallet board lifted off, slowly at first. I tapped more keys and it swiveled, dipped, swooped. I found a bug and landed, made some code changes, took off again. This time it performed as I had hoped and I nudged it smartly upward. At first there was a stiff breeze from my acceleration, but it soon thinned. At the front corner of the pallet, the air pressure was dropping perilously. It was down to two tenths of a bar and dropping, but the gauge on my wrist was pegged at seven tenths of a bar and I was breathing easily. A little later, the gauge on the pallet had dropped to zero and the sky had turned black, but my wrist still said seven-tenths of an atmosphere. 
I was in outer space, and the fucking thing was keeping me alive. The moon was up, big and tempting. I pointed my little craft toward it and hauled ass. I accelerated about half a gravity for three hours and then reversed thrust. At turnaround, I figure I was going about 40 kilometers a second. I could have gone a lot faster, but it wouldn't have been good if the chair or one of the force generators had loosened itself from the pallet board. As the moon became a world hovering above me, I aimed near the edge in case I'd miscalculated the deceleration. Then I floated out over the other side. I found a crater and set my craft down. I don't know much lunar geography, so I can't really give you a very good idea where I was. I loaded up the front boxes with rocks and walked abound, the 13th person of my species to do so. Lucky 13. The naked sun was brutal, but my skin was cool and I was comfortable. I didn't seem to be getting sunburned. I took deep breaths and the air was cool and clean and dry, and there was no indication at all of where it was coming from or where it went when I exhaled. I looked directly at the sun, and its brightness somehow dialed down to a range that made it observable. It occurred to me that I had finally attained a measure of solitude that few humans ever experienced. All I had to do was rip the tape from my thigh, separate myself from the safety generator, and I could die on my own terms. But if I didn't return, all of my old friends would also die. I no longer cared whether I continued to live but I wasn't yet at the point where I could accept responsibility for that. So I got back on the seat, strapped myself in, and floated up into the infinite blackness. From here, I could go to Mars or Jupiter or even some distant star, and with very little effort, one could use a gang of these force generators to outfit a properly equipped craft that could actually return home from such a journey. But instead I went back, with more difficulty than I expected, found the installation in Idaho, and delivered my load of moon rocks to a pair of rather dumbfounded agents. They made me take a physical, which showed no ill effects from my day trip in space. Clearly, the safety generator was as much space suit as it was mugger repellent. With such devices, it would be a trivial matter for humans to colonize all of the solid worlds of our solar system. But then again, what would happen if they just stopped working one day? I had my trip in space, and I took one rock with me home as a souvenir when I went home. The fifth gift. We've had an idea, Smith told me. That must have hurt, I said. The matter generator creates a perfect shield before the duplication process is triggered. We think you could test the new device within the duplication shield. It's certainly a better shield than anything we've ever built, but the book suggests this new thing is much more advanced. They seem quite proud of it. Well, the other thing would be to trigger it with a timer. Do you think the field would cut off if the circuit was interrupted? Yes, the book is very clear on that. Then let's test it in the duplicator shield with the timed cutoff. Upstairs, they think this is an acceptable approach. Well, who am I to argue with upstairs? So we set it up with a big alligator clips on the new gift and my matter generator panel. I set the matter generator controls to duplicate the test room into another empty room and wired up a trigger. Tr the trigger would fire one time delay relay that would hold the matter generator shield up for 10 seconds and another that would trigger a second relay in two seconds and that third relay would hold the new device online for five seconds. I figured that would give me time to sample its effects while hopefully isolating the rest of the world. We made the arrangements and I entered the test room. The agents watched through a closed circuit TV link that we all knew would go blank when the shield was up. I used a big screwdriver to tighten all the wires and then hit the trigger. The walls turned mirror. I was within the shield, just like the time we tried to see if the matter generator would duplicate me. It had copied the chair I was sitting on and my clothes and my jewelry and my wallet and even some threads we identified as being the permanent sutures from my hernia repair, but it didn't copy my body. This time we wouldn't even be triggering the copy function. The second relay clicked. The new device came online. The walls were no longer mirrored. I found myself self saying shit. And then the sanity generator. Five seconds. The fifth gift simply turned off the matter generator, which was a relatively primitive thing by the standards of our benefactors. 
As the fields established itself, it overshot, and for one bright moment it seemed I was sharing the thoughts of every single human being on the planet. I could sense Jones and Smith outside the door, reeling from the same sense I was. Further afield was a dim murmur, except for people I had some connection with. I could feel the friends I'd abandoned, who were suddenly aware of me, as I was of them. In that moment we knew everything about one another, and I knew that if Smith and Jones recovered their wits, they'd all be killed. And my friends knew that too, and they forgave me. And I felt Jennifer. She had been seeing other men, but only because she thought I didn't care. I had abandoned her without explanation, now that she knew why, and the people I worked for could, would come to kill her. Four seconds. My consciousness reeling, I tried to find someone, anyone else to sense, who wasn't going to die soon. Instead, I found someone so deep in gambling debt that he was staring down the barrel of a hitman's gun. The hitman was trying to pull the trigger, and his face was a mask of pain and confusion. I can't kill you, he was screaming. It's my fucking job, but I can't kill you. I can't kill you, and I don't fucking know why. I reeled again to some military training ground. The cadets, who had been marching smartly around, had halted and were standing at ease, shifting about, suddenly assaulted by doubts about the very nature of what they had been doing. And their sergeant, who had moments before been barking orders, was saying that maybe they needed to take a break. Three seconds. All violence, the very drumbeat of human existence for more than a hundred thousand years, had come to a halt everywhere on earth. It was a thing I could feel in my very bones. And more than that, in the marble talls where policies were being set that might doom a generation to poverty, priorities had been suddenly and drastically rearranged. The men in those chambers had barely had time to lift their pens from the contracts they were signing, but things were very different with them. Somewhere, I don't know where because it, the sanity field made distance a bit meaningless, a gang of young men were beating on someone in a hidden alley. It was clear in their minds that they had intended to kill their victim, but now suddenly the beating stopped and the leader pulled out a cellular phone and dialed 911 to call an ambulance. I could still feel Jennifer and she could feel me and her reaction was not the hatred I expected and deserved, but delight. Her faith in me had been vindicated. I had only acted to protect her, and under the old rules, that had been a sensible thing. But now it wasn't necessary, at least for two more seconds. Two seconds. Somewhere in a European capital, a man was riding the subway with 12 pounds of explosives strapped to his body and a trigger in his pocket. He had been clutching the trigger, playing with it, stealing himself for his final act in the war between his people and their oppressors. But now he left the trigger alone, and when the doors opened, he left the train and returned to the world. Out in the open air of a nearby park, he would unwire and take off the explosives. Deep in a London slum, a room was filled with torpid bodies which suddenly, quietly awakened. The heroine was no longer at work in them, but neither were they now addicted. They looked around with dawning expressions of horror and hope as if to ask, What the hell am I doing here? The field was leveling out. I was losing the sense of other people's thoughts and getting more of an idea of what the field was designed to do. And now I knew why the aliens were willing to trust us with these gifts we had thought so dangerous. To them, we were children, and these were the educational toys you would give a child so that he might develop to the point where first principles could be taught. This fifth and final gift was the most important of all, because, I understood implicitly, our benefactors had originally made it for themselves. This is why we did not have to fear the other gifts being suddenly denied. We would soon feel the same way toward all of our own, and to do such harm would simply be unthinkable. One second. There wasn't a single human being anywhere on earth now who wasn't aware of the gifts. There wasn't a single human being anywhere whose urges to violence and self-destruction hadn't been suddenly and more sensibly re been redirected. No wonder the aliens were so proud of the fucking thing. Except that the timer was about to go off. Smith and Jones came in with solder and a torch. I was holding the screwdriver across the sanity generator's terminals, and I held it there while they fixed a permanent jumper across it. You might as well take copies of the other gifts with you, Smith said. We'll have to figure out how to distribute them. It shouldn't be hard. We can duplicate our own panels along with the matter generators, and with them driving the process, it should be exponential. Within a few days, we'll have the whole planet covered. It's hard to see exactly where it will go, Smith said. I'm not sure what we'll do. He looked at Jones. You'll find something, I said. You'll still be competent, well-controlled people, and nobody will resent what you did. 
No, I guess they won't, Joan said. If you don't mind, I'm going to take the pallet flyer. I want to find Jennifer. Of course. They helped me load copies of the gifts into the boxes. Don't forget this, Joan said. He handed me a second copy of the safety generator. You might want to take your girl on vacation. Fuck vacation. I might want to take her to live someplace where even an Iridium phone won't reach. And that's exactly what I did. This has been The Fifth Gift, written and narrated by Roger Williams for Tommy's podcast. That was fucking insane. <laughs> that's why you're my favorite author, because that sensation is what I had reading Mopey. That was incredible. I'm going to splice this off the end of this episode and upload <laughs> it as a, sec- a separate episode. That was fan-fucking-tastic. <laughs> That was brilliant, Roger. Thank you. Well, Julie, the, thank you. That was wonderful. That was beautiful. I thought you would like it. I uh, fucking loved it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I did a sort of a mini audit on myself after Corrosion went down the flaming tubes and uh, mm-hmm. realized that every story I've ever written that's fictional has been about the relationship between humans and some godlike entity. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So that is uh, obviously uh, my hobby horse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then but this was one of the first things I ever wrote. Like I said, I had uh, I wrote it in the '80s, and then I lost my only copy of it in somehow in the computer shuffle, and uh, I reproduced it. Uh, kind of as an apology because i wrote another uh, essay which uh i guess i can read that to you sometime Mm -hmm. called hannibal lecter transhumanist icon (laughs) 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 and uh a few of the corrosion people who identified as transhumanists took issue with that so But uh, but I reconstructed that old story because I I wanted to show them that uh, as as I had said about that essay that it's just it's one of many ways of looking at the thing you know it's sometimes the godlike being is benevolent mm-hmm. sometimes the godlike being is uh, indifferent mm-hmm. sometimes it is a more rich complex thing I thought I thought it was beautiful. And I almost kind of, it almost kind of ties in well with the whole Israeli space guy, right? Kind that's of why I thought, I thought it was like, I was, I was going to just like, well, okay, well, I was planning to read that story to you. That was going to be the topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after, after we, uh, we discussed all this, it was like, well, you know, actually this time. It's <laughs> really, really well, actually. actually. It couldn't have fit better, right? So yeah, this, so this was this was uh, a take that I had in the late 1980s about how aliens might come, and you know now and 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 this story is a little bit of a Rorschach test because mm-hmm. there was a certain group that insisted on seeing the gifts as an eat here sign, that that they couldn't see the possibility of it actually being benevolent. They, mm-hmm. It had to be sinister. Yeah. So, you know, and and I was like, well, if you look at the progression, though, it's like, I don't, I don't see how you could get that out of it because, as the as the narrator himself says, the aliens just could have made the first gift. They could, have, thing. not even that. They could have just wiped us out without us ever even knowing. Yeah, and and my feeling about it when I was writing it is that these aliens might not even have three, you know, solid three dimensional bodies. They might be like. Yeah plasma beings that live in the heart of a star or pure energy beings and they're only aware of us because of the fifth gift thing however that works yeah yeah so they 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 learned that there are beings out there that have other other impossible what i mean they might be in a different dimension they might be outside of four four dimensional time space yeah, and but but they they learned of us just as as all of the people on Earth were learning of each other in the last act. Through they some sort of loving sentience. They found out about us, and so they gave us. Oh, they they know that we need we need energy. We need uh, the ability to make things. We need you know. So they they provided our needs, and mm-hmm. then they provided us the sense to not fuck ourselves over with them. 
So. <laughs> I fucking I like it, Roger. I think that's I think that's some of your best work. It's truly. Thanks. Truly. I mean, I am obviously a diehard of uh of Mopey, but that, but as Mopey is just like it starts to dawn on me what's happening and it's like fuck yes. And what it reminds me of is in Mopey when it's like they go to the White House and it's like the president resigned at noon. It's just kind of like, well, <laughs> all right. Well, you know, it's like you said, like Reagan, like backs up. All right. Well, you know, just kind of walk out the front door. Yeah. Or whatever. It's over. Yeah. Doesn't, well, doesn't... Well, because, because, because in my mental space, it was Reagan. Yeah. 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 Well, I know and... it's like, yeah. Secret <laughs> service is just like, all right. No, they just leave. Yeah. Doesn't he's, matter. He's an actor. He knows when the job is over. Yeah. Yeah. I know. He's like, <laughs> he's like, all right. He's like, I like the energy, everybody, you know, <laughs> you know, and cut it's like all right but it's like this act that's been going on since the dawn of time and it's like we just hit this break and everyone's going to the green room it's like oh it's over now and it's that's what i liked about it yeah (laughs) roger that was fucking brilliant that truly was but um let's wrap this bitch up because i'm starving but um (laughs) i don't think i've ever ended a podcast for food this might be a first uh, I think you did before. Well, yeah, th- I like that, man. That was, we should definitely do more of, because the two episodes we've done where you read, I've thoroughly enjoyed them. You're two for two. I think we should do another episode where you uh, narrate. All right. Well, and uh, it's like, if once I figure out what the hell happened with the fucking microphone, yeah. then uh, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, next time, uh, if we don't have another topic that gets in the way, I'll do Passages in the Void. Fuck yeah. Which is, uh, it's 10,000 words, so it should take about an hour. Fuck yeah. I'm down, man. I thoroughly enjoy it. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy, I get to be the audience member. I thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. Now, the one thing is, is that you might notice that I was, I was facing the camera. The, uh, what I did is I put the zoom thing off on the side monitor and put my source material on the monitor under the camera. Yeah. So that I would be watching you. Yeah. But that also meant I couldn't see your re- your reactions because yeah. you were over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, passages will be good for at least three stories because the first the first three stories were each about ten thousand words, and uh, they start with the human race going extinct and artificial intelligences. Uh, picking up pieces. Fuck yeah. He's dead. Fuck so, yeah. yeah. Those are the godlike beings in that universe. Fuck yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, who else in the world gets to read a book, realize that this is their favorite author, meet their favorite author, and then have their favorite author narrate stories by them that I haven't heard to me? <laughs> who, I mean, in like how many times in human history has that happened? Where you're like, hey, J.K. Rowling, I loved Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. She's like, why don't you have a seat? I'm going to read you the next six. And you're like, fuck. <laughs> Are these, these so, well, and, you know, well uh, actually, if we do passages, the third of the passages stories, each of which is about 10,000 words, actually got published. But I was paid uh, second, I, I didn't have first north american serial rights anymore because i had published it on corrosion so i was paid reprint mm-hmm. at a penny a word bastards the oh no they uh oh, they wait ten thousand oh wait so that's what it was it was it was a hundred dollars and some odds <laughs> you know, like a hundred dollars and 51 cents it's not bad <laughs> um not bad at all. hey bought beer yeah and uh and the, the guy who uh bought, it was uh it was published by uh a startup magazine called bull spec which is I don't even know. I don't know what that. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like a fucking. It sounds like a. It sounds like a boner supplement you'd buy at a gas station. But uh, yeah, the guy. Yeah, you know, before the guy started his magazine, he asked if I would be willing to sell him the the reprint rights to that particular story, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, man." And it was like four years later. Fuck yeah, I think it's bad. <laughs> well, let's um, I'll text you. Let's definitely set up a a, a date next week, okay. and um. Yeah, man. Let's absolutely do that. Fucking, I appreciate it, dude. That was such a treat. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm gonna... 
I'm going <laughs> to cut that off the original and upload it as a uh, as its own episode because I don't want it. To be, I don't want that to be lost in the podcast. I want uh, that's too good to be hidden. So that's what I'm going to do. So um, yeah, you're, oh. dude, dude, you mean you're going to actually do some audio editing? No, 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 no. Don't get ahead of your don't get don't get ahead of yourself, Buster. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna splice here. And then I'll delete. So instead of going three clicks, I'll probably do maybe seven clicks in iMovie. Which is really I'm going out of that's fucking that's big dick energy for me, all right? Oh, for everybody listening, uh, the po- I used to say it a lot, and then I stopped because I didn't give a shit. Podcast available on BitChute. It's not on Veo anymore. V e o h. It's some weird Japanese website. They stopped letting me upload after like 250 episodes, which is fucking gay and retarded. So fuck them. DTube, same thing. I uploaded like 100 episodes, and they're like, now it's only 5.99 an episode. I was like, I'm not fucking giving you money to give you content that you can put ads on. But I learned of a new website this morning, Rumble, that I don't think is new. I think it's smaller than BitChute. Maybe it's bigger. But it's another alternative to YouTube. And that's because as of today, YouTube says that um, if you post anything that they consider fraudulent election news, your channel can be yanked. Well, I have multiple episodes of like ex Delta Force guys calling for like armed revolution. So I, yeah, only, I noticed that. It's only a matter of time before this channel is gone. So, um, <laughs> As always, the link is on BitChute, will be Tommy's podcast, and it will now be on Rumble, Tommy's podcast. So um, you won't know when this channel is yanked because I won't be here to be able to make a post about it being yanked. The account will be gone. So it's only a matter of time. And um, I refuse to take down those episodes because I look at that as much as free speech as saying, buy Roger's book or I'll burn your house down. Like, it's just... I'm just not for it. So um, if this that's how this channel goes down, then I'm, I'll am i ride this bitch into the ground and uh, rumble and bitch shoot, and uh, it will never die. Sometimes it will pop up. Doesn't matter. Wherever we go, you'll still be coming back. We'll just be uploading on a new website. I don't give a fuck. Double middle fingers. Ride this bitch out. I don't care. Just 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 means the link I send my dad will have a different URL. Different you. That's all it is. <laughs> same good. Same good. Same goods. Different URL. Doesn't doesn't matter. We have the safety gift on. It, it, it. I have that gift taped to my thigh. YouTube can abolish me. I'll be. Like, I'll just go to the next one. I can't. You can't fuck with me. So, eat a dick, YouTube. Google was founded on "Don't be evil," and there has never been a greater irony in the history of corporations. Thank well, you, you know, I, I said that shortly after the IPO. Google dropped the word don't from their logo. <laughs> hey, they're just like, hey, we're just, we're just making it simpler. And it's like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh-huh. yeah. Everything, everything. Well, it's, it's, it's like delisting my, uh, my website because yeah. I was hosting my own content. Yeah. You know, my what? wife warned yeah. me about that and I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know what? It's you know he may be a nut job, but when it started with censoring Alex Jones a year and a half ago, I remember saying I was like, "We'll start with him, and everyone will applaud, and it will be one thing." So right now it's starting with twenty twenty fake news. Just you wait. Soon it will be. Did you say something fraudulent about China? Soon did you say something fraudulent mm-hmm. about CO two emissions? Did you well, say it's not things? soon? It's not soon if you're in China right China. now. It's no, been no, the no. case for like five years. But now in the United States, now it's going to be. Did you say something fraudulent about? Now they're going to get you for anything. This is how it starts. So, what a fitting episode that I'm wearing my Alex Jones hoodie. This is how it begins. <laughs> so we'll be on Rumble, BitChute, DTube, Vo, all of those. The show doesn't die. And if there is an electromagnetic pulse or a solar flare that wipes out all the data on the Earth. You got it all on your heart. I will be, I will corner the market on entertainment. <laughs> you will be me. I will be the state delivered entertainment. Henry Ford, you can have a Model T in any color you want as long as it's black. You can have any entertainment you want in a post nuclear world as long as it's Tommy's podcast. <laughs> I will reign. I will reign king and you will be the storyteller. It will be oral tradition and people will pass down our stories. I need some food because clearly as my blood sugar goes down, I turn into a megalomaniac. So. Yeah. I, I, I kind of see that. Yeah. Can I see the horn sprouting? It's me. me. No. Soon it's going to start getting a German tint in my words. The, but the blood sugar thing fucks me up too. So Yeah. 
<laughs> he's slicing, slicing. Yeah, don't need that. But um, Roger Williams, author of Metamorphosis of Prime Intellect, will be sticking in the top comment and in the description. Buy it tonight or I will burn down your place of residence. <laughs> Take that to the bank. Roger, I'll send you this one. This is a long episode. This one probably won't be uploaded till tomorrow. That's not but, uh, Yeah. Whenever. All right, yeah. man. Well, I'll shoot you a text. And let's, uh, I'll, I'll, fuck, I'll screenshot the calendar right now. Shoot you a text. And um, yeah, let's do an online narration next week. But until then, I don't need to do that right now. All right. All right, Roger. I'll see you. See you man. I will see you before. We'll do another episode before Christmas. So, I'm not oh, gonna, I think yeah. we should. Yeah. yeah. We got probably got two more, right? What's today? Yeah. Ninth, yeah, we still got two more episodes, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we get. Yeah. This is only the ninth. Yeah, I don't know why I thought. I don't know why I thought Christmas. We got the sixteenth and the. Well, like, well, I mean, this is Wednesday. Which normally we don't do Wednesday, so. But regardless, fourteen twice in fourteen days. That will be yeah. We'll do yeah. Two. Yeah. So. All right, man. <laughs> Let's wrap this bitch up. Roger Williams, thank you, my friend. I'll text you, and until um, next time, brother.